Hello and welcome to the first in this, uh, in the third of our series on architecture and philosophy. Um, I'm showing you here the overall slide for the overall poster for the, the series itself. We have seven sessions um, and uh, it should be a very interesting uh, 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 course itself. Let me just simply say that we are, the one thing that remains almost constant throughout is that we, the starting time, we will be starting at uh, 10 a.m. EST, um, no matter what, apart from for one session, which is the one with Susanna Kova um, on uh, the 9th of April, where we'll be starting um, it, in the in the uh, in the evening, I think nine o'clock uh, um, EST. Uh, otherwise, we will sticking with the with the 10 a.m. EST start. But th that doesn't mean to say it's always the same time because uh, we start off next week. We start uh, um, daylight saving finishes in the states, and then I think it's on the 26th. Um, daylight finish saving finishes on the uh, on um, in, in Europe. So the start times are going to be varying slightly, depending on where you are. Um, but hopefully uh, it'll be become very clear. So 10 o'clock, uh, 10 a.m. EST for most of our sessions, um, and they'll all be on Sundays. Um, so just to kind of briefly just to read this out, just in case you cannot read the, the slide itself. Uh, we're starting today. It's a great honor to have great Graham Gillick here again with us on Secret Crack Hour. Next week, we'll be dealing with... Um, uh, with Homi Baba, with Felipe Hernandez, um, who was one of my doctoral candidates at the University of Nottingham, and who has written extensively on on, on, uh, on Homi Baba. He did his PhD on uh, Homi Baba and wrote a book, Homi Baba for, Baba for Architects. Um, uh, the next session is going to be uh, with Al, um, Albina Yaneva, who herself was a PhD student under Bruno Latour and collaborated with Bruno Latour on, on various articles. Um, she, uh, she has been the author of a book, Latour for Architects. Andre Radman and Savros Pusolis will be joining us again. Um, <clears throat> Andre was with us before, and they'll be doing a session on Henri Bergson. And uh, uh, Andre's PhD was itself on Andre, but uh, was on, on Henri Bergson. We're following on by Heidi Sohn and, and Robert Gorney. There's a slight spelling typo there. It should be Gorney rather than Gourmi. Uh, looking at Donna Haraway, um, followed up by the session that's going to be slightly out of sync time-wise, which is, say, Susanna Kova. Uh, on Yulia Kristeva, and Susanna also she did her PhD on, on Yulia Kristeva. And finally, we have an interesting kind of session where we have, we're pairing up um, Luisa Lorenza uh, Corner, who did her PhD on Manfredo Tafuri, with um, Pippo uh, 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 Cura, who is uh, um, an architect. And I think they take slightly different views on Manfredo Tafuri, but that will be interesting in itself. So this is another, this is a further addition to um, the, the two previous series uh, on architectural philosophy as part of the doctoral consortium. I mean, just to say also the idea behind the doctoral consortium is that it doesn't make sense anymore to have individual PhD students working with um, uh, individual professors in individual classrooms when we can all join a single shared platform and share ideas uh, across the globe. Um, and, and not only that, but it allows us to, uh, to, to break through not only the physical walls of the classroom, but also the economic, social, and political barriers that often um, prevent certain individuals from having access to certain ideas. What we're trying to do is to share this uh, uh, this session around the around the globe. Um, and I know for the, uh, that we have many people across the globe right now. And I just want to admit, just mentioned briefly uh, Vasco, who is in Bangladesh, who is watching right now. That there are many um, in Iran, Iraq, and and so on. Um, <clears throat> and that's the idea that we can share these ideas and 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 try, in some sense, to democratize education. So that's going to be the series. It's going to be, I think, a very exciting series, um, uh, and it's it's added it's uh, 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 it's adding to the previous um, session. We just go and jump forward one slide a second to say that this is where um, we have put all the previous sessions um, on architecture philosophy up onto the uh, the Digital Futures uh, YouTube channel, which is uh, the, the, which is recorded down here. If you want to do a, a screen capture to to, to capture that. Uh, we also have a website, Digital Futures International website, and also an Instagram account, uh, Digital Futures, um, which uh, where everything is posted. All the all the uh, information is posted in, in advance, and also for my my own Instagram account, uh, Neil H fourteen, where I will be posting all these sessions. Um, but here we have the what what the uh, the series that we had before. There were two series that started off with Slavoj Žižek with an individual lecture, um, and then we went through to a, to a, a a series of, of sessions on some of the key thinkers of the 20th century, including Derrida, Deleuze, Sixu, uh, um, Butler, and so on. Um, and they're all recorded there. And the idea is to have a to create a repository of information uh, about um, uh, uh, about these thinkers that, that's there as a permanent resource. One thing we noticed um, 
uh, was that in the past there are not so many um, uh, podcasts or recorded videos of some of these key thinkers, but now we've at least made this available. We bring together authorities on those key thinkers from around the world um, to talk about them. Um, so um, uh, let me um, let me uh, get, move on move on to just introduce say a few words about Graham Gillett. Graham is somebody that uh, I was. Um, it, it introduced to uh, back in the 90s, and I wrote a review of his excellent book, uh, Myth of Metropolis, which um, appeared on the back cover. Um, exceptional book about the Benjamin and the city. Um, um, and uh, Graham, of course, was with us for, for two sessions before, one on Benjamin and one on Baudria. Uh, I can really recommend that book. Um, he also wrote a, 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 an overview of, of Walter Benjamin um, uh, uh, for, for the Critical Conservations uh, series. And he has two books out on Krakow, one on the right-hand side, the one that he is a is one that he was the author of, and then there's a co-edited uh, book on Siegfried Krakow that is um, also very, very useful. So um, Graham is a, is a professor at the University of Salford. Um, he, he has been there the whole time, I think, and uh, is one of the people I hugely respect in the world of kind of cultural theory and sociology. Um, and certainly, I think one of the most um, eminent co uh, commentators on Benjamin and, and the, the authority on, on Siegfried Krakow. So um, uh, anyway, it's great to have Graham with us today. The, the, what we're gonna do, I'm going to make a presentation first of all, um, and then uh, Graham will make his own presentation. In the past, Graham has always provided just simply um, uh, a text, and I've been provided the images. Uh, today, I think there's... Um, uh, um, uh, uh, he has a number of images, so let's see. It's, I think there's going to be a certain overlap, which is probably a very interesting way of approaching it. But let me just start by um, by, by showing. Um, I think the the, the 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 kind of constellation of thinkers in which which I tend to sort of associate uh, Krakow with. Um, uh, Georg Simmel, in some sense, was 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 the kind of the the, the grandfather, the godfather, whatever it was, a, a particular way of thinking, and I'll make, mention him in a briefly, but he's a different generation uh, to the other three. Uh, Georg Zimmel actually taught Siegfried Krakow, um, and they're, they're all related in many ways. These are all German Jewish intellectuals who are uh, interested in, in, um, in, 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 in basically, I think, disrupting and, and, and updating approaches towards but particularly aesthetics and, and understanding of, of, of our contemporary world. I, what I would say also is I think all these thinkers have a a, a real, really fresh take on the question about modernity, uh, and with a, a sort of, a, I think, a rate that allows them to sort of say some things, um, hugely insightful sort of comments that that are maybe less easy to make today. At the very onset of modernity, they were able to track and see what was happening and really offer a, a, a an astonishing, um, interesting take on things. I want to emphasize here that I've used the term modernity as the kind of key cultural epoch. If we talk about modernism, we're talking about the the, the aesthetic reflex, shall we say, of that epoch, um, the style, the way in which things were presented. And of course, there is a particular way in terms of the writing that, that is here that makes it distinctive. Georg Zimmel was a leader in some senses in, 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 in breaking down the tradition of a very sort of rather uh, uh, Deutsch kind of a, uh, elevated sort of way of talking about things, to talk about things in, in a sort of everyday language, and also to talk about subject matter that was not necessarily thought at the time to be worthy of of uh, of discussion, um, subject matters to do with everyday life itself, and especially with life in the city. And I would say the first three of these are really uh, interested in modernity as urban modernity. So um, I'm going to come back to some to that in a moment. Let me just simply move on, move on to give some sort of framework for understanding um, the timeline in a sense, or, the, or or positioning this kind of work within an architectural context. And so I want to just mention so briefly a few iconic moments. I hope I have the dates right here um, in terms of what was happening uh, in the in the in the 20s in particular um, in, in Germany. And of course, what also the other thing that was going to be a refrain that comes across throughout this is the fact that many of those uh, about whom I'm speaking, especially Krakow himself, left Germany and moved to the States um, or attempted to move to the States. <clears throat> and I thought Walter Gropius, who was behind um, the Bauhaus um, in Dessau was, of course, uh, one such individual. He moved to Boston. He became a professor at Harvard, um, and uh, but he started off in Germany in an incredible moment, I think, uh, between the, the two world wars when Germany really was 
um, uh, buzzing with, with intellectual ideas, with designers, with, um, with philosophers, with a, a range of, of things. It was a moment of extraordinary creativity. Um, but it was in this kind of crucible that basically some of these ideas were, were hatched in a sense. So 2025, 2025, 26 for the Bauhaus, and then um, the, the Barcelona Pavilion by Mies van der Rohe, who of course also was a director of the Bauhaus, um, was in 1929. Um, <clears throat> um, we could also see um, uh, books like uh, uh, Hildesheimer's um, uh, Gostadt Architektur, uh, the architecture of the metropolis that came out in 27, which presents a particular kind of view, a rather abstract in some senses, um, uh, 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 a dehumanizing view of the city, but this was all part of what was going on um, in, in, in the, in the mid-20s. And of course, alongside that, within the cinema, uh, the Fritz Lang's Metropolis, which had um, a huge impact of uh, in, in many ways. Let me just play a, a, a short excerpt of this because, um, and I wanted both both co compare, but also to contrast in some senses um, during my short presentation, um, the kind of view of the city that Fritz Lang uh, presents compared to the view of the city that Krakow presents. And what becomes very interesting, this is a, a short clip from Metropolis, is the way in which the workers here are part of the machinery, shall we say, of modernity. They are themselves almost cogs in a wheel um, or uh, within a kind of a, a machine itself. And, and that itself is, 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 in some sense, part of the problem and certainly in Metropolis. Um, where human beings simply can be degraded and, and uh, in some sense abused within this context. But nonetheless, what I want to point out there is, is that there are uh, a range of sort of viewpoints. And this, in some sense, is about, whereas I was showing you before architecture, this is about the city, the city uh, the, as, uh, about urban uh, um, urban and modernity within urbanism um, and about the context, the, 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 the lives, the, the, the period in which these lives were being led. And it seems to me that we, there's something very, very special about this particular moment, and a particular moment in the way in which uh, uh, th these thinkers that I'm referring to began to address the city, the city as the site of modernity, um, as the quintessential um, uh, aspect of what's happening, a, a city that's going through itself many changes and becoming something completely different. And I want to mention, I know that Graham's gonna be referring to Georg Zimmel, um, but I want to mention briefly this highly influential text, which is In Rethinking Architect of the Metropolis, A Mental Life, which is one of the, my favorite essays um, about, um, about modernity. And this was written in 1903. Um, and while well, I'm showing you here a kind of a view of what seems by comparison with today a fairly sedate city, um, a city of, of maybe a few trams um, and, and, and horse and carts and things. It was the way in which um, Georg Simmel describes the city of modernity which is actually realized later on as a, a kind of a moment of kind of urban intensity, shall we say. Uh, and he describes how there are, there's now a kind of a, a certain sensibility, a certain mentality that came out of this, which is quite different to say, let's say life in the countryside or life in the village or, or the smaller towns, a certain frenzy, the, the electrifying impulses that would come from the city itself, um, where as, as Georg Dimmel put it, the simply crossing the road would fray the nerves. Um, you are bombarded by sensations in the modern metropolis. Maybe I'll move on to something that gives you a, more, a, a, a better sense of um, this, um, an illustration by Georg uh, uh, Gior Grotz of the metropolis a little later, but it gives you a sense of the frenzy, the frenzy of modernity, um, the frenzy of urban modernity. And for Simmel, importantly, the only way to survive these kind of this oversaturation of impulses, the kaleidoscopic images, the uh, uh, the, the, the bombardment of sensations of the noises uh, of the city, it's the cacophony of the city. The only way to survive those, uh, it, it was to shut down. Otherwise, you'd be, the, the senses be overstimulated. So he speaks about the, <clears throat> the individual um, as being the blase individual who is the creation of this kind of space. And for Zimmel, uh, the city was itself needed to be understood in terms of the logic of money itself. And it's the way in which the individual, this blase individual, began to navigate the city as a kind of disinterested um, um, blase individual that echoed the abstract circulation of money within metropolis. And this kind of set the scene for an understanding about the city, uh, for understanding the city as a site of modernity and something that was rich and, and deserving um, of in its own right. I mentioned just briefly here that David Frisbee, 
who edited this book was also the person who put me in contact with Graham Gillick in the first place. David Frisbee was a very famous um, sociologist, sadly he's no longer with us, um, <clears throat> but he, um, he himself took a master's in architecture uh, at the Glasgow School of Art. I was actually his examiner, a remarkable scholar, um, both of, of Zimmel, Benjamin, um, Krakow and many others. Indeed, his book Fragments of Modernity is one of the, the most important books about that particular period. So um, let me simply play a, um, I hope it's going to play a, a video to give you a sense of really what was happening um, at the time. This is uh, the Symphony of the City which was in 1927. So it locates us exactly in this kind of period that I was sketching out in terms of the architecture of the time, a moment of, 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 of extraordinary production in terms of, 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 um, of, of Germany and a, a, and a moment of, of in which the cities like Berlin became extraordinary sort of um, urban centers um, that really had a huge impact uh, in, in the world at large. Um, and of course, this was right before the 30s when um, then something else was happening in Germany, um, the growth of fascism, the development of fascism, on which Krakauer, Benjamin, and so many others um, both commentated, but were also a victim of as, as German Jewish intellectuals. Um, and I should say, it goes back further than this, I would say that Georg Zimmel himself suffered from being a, a Jewish uh, intellectual. Um, he never got a full-time academic appointment because of that. So it was kind of, everything was in the shadow of something that was eventually erupt in the 1930s. And we found ourselves in a very different sort of world. But it's in the context of this, not necessarily of, a, of aesthetics itself, not necessarily in terms of architecture as a style or architecture as, a, um, as an aesthetic reflex, but rather in terms of modernity, of urban modernity, this melting pot in which all these things came together. That's really what I want to try and address today. And it became the subject of, of uh, uh, Siegfried Krakauer's uh, research, um, a research that he eventually took to America and then turned into the a theory of film itself. So there was something happening in Germany in the 1930s that was truly uh, astonishing, truly remarkable um, of, a, uh, of a new era, uh, an era that had the, the, the clouds uh, of, of fascism and, and of course the Second World War, um, uh, looming on the horizon, but an era of a huge creativity in many, many different domains. So um, let's uh, look at Krakow himself. And um, <clears throat> what I want to emphasize is, in a way, the crucial um, uh, uh, way to understand uh, uh, Krakow is in relation to, to, to Walter Benjamin. I mean, I, 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 um, I know that Graham's going to refer to that more, but let me simply say that they, the two of them were close friends. They were collaborators in many ways. They both worked for the Frankfurt Zeitung and um, writing for the Feuilleton for these, these articles, informed articles, opinion pieces. Um, and they were roughly the same, the, the, the same, same age. I think um, uh, Benjamin was born uh, uh, three or four years earlier than, than, um, uh, than Krakow, but roughly the same age. And Krakow, unusually for, for, for rethinking architecture, I didn't uh, select um, um, many, any, he was the only one who was actually trained as an architect, even though he became a kind of cultural theorist and later a film theorist. He was the only one that I included in Rethinking Architecture who had a background in architecture. And here you can see roughly what happens in terms of his career. He studied architecture and he worked as an architecture uh, briefly uh, for seven years before becoming uh, a hugely influential um, journalist working um, for the Frankfurter Zeitung, uh, where he wrote opinion pieces largely often about the city itself. Um, and uh, he became, I guess, a kind of, sort of writer researcher throughout his life. Um, initially, in, uh, it, it, he moved to France to become a writer to escape from, from what, was, what was brewing in Germany. And then to escape what was going to happen, was happening in France at the time, he then, uh, he then moved to, to, to the States and uh, became based in New York. Um, and he published a couple of books while he was there on film theory, um, which I'm sure Graham will talk about also, um, until he died in 1966. Now, what is interesting about, about um, Krakow, as, and indeed also in the sense about um, uh, Benjamin, is it was the, the kind of the posthumous kind of like publications about his work that really um, made him um, a, 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 a better name. He didn't become a, a household name like Benjamin um, for various reasons, but nonetheless, uh, the, these books in English, um, especially the Mass Ornament published in 1995, were hugely significant contributions that now have been reappraised in some sense, even though he was um, um, <coughs> he was not perhaps as, as prominent um, as a cultural theorist um, in, during his life itself. 
And we can contrast this with, with Benjamin, who would, would, would had a more kind of academic beginning in a sense, taking a PhD um, and, and attempting to become an academic. Eventually, he also became a kind of white writer researcher. And importantly, Benjamin failed to make it across to the States. Tragically, of course, we know that he committed suicide um, uh, just on the, on the Spanish-French uh, border. And, and when he was, he was, um, he was prevented from, from making his way uh, to, to find his way to New York, to, 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 to the States where he was, he was going to be, um, uh, uh, where he was, he had, had a, he already had a, um, a, his journey um, covered and paid for. Um, the important thing here also is, is to sort of, um, to see, to see that, that Krakauer changed the orientation of his work towards, towards, um, towards the movies in the, in the country, the country of Hollywood. What would Benjamin have done had he moved to the States? What would he have been fascinated by? Would he have been working on the same sort of way? Or would he have shifted into new domains? Would he have started to become a kind of theorist of television and so on? Or indeed the movies like Krakauer? We don't know. But all we know is, 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 is what happened in terms of Krakauer, who showed the potential and possibly of what Benjamin might have done had he moved to the States. Um, but it was, I think, in many ways, uh, the the comparison between Benjamin and Krakow that, to my mind, is really interesting. They are, in some ways, similar but also different. And I'm sure Graham has something to say also on the differences. But let me pick up first of all on the on the um, on the similarities. One of the famous kind of comments that Benjamin makes is to live is to leave traces, and he is a kind of a socialist historian who was really interested in kind of in in a sense in redeeming the buried fragments of those who had been crushed by history, saw himself as a commentator who was in some senses was reading those fragments, was seeing the city as some kind of hieroglyphic text that he could decode in some sense. Now, not decoding it necessarily um, it with the same kind of rigor that, that structuralism and later post-structuralism did, but starting off by seeing it as something that could be read and interpreted. And of course, uh, Benjamin himself wrote extensively on the city, it became the site of modernity and, and his kind of research, especially the, uh, the case project, the Passage and Verk that was eventually published um, after his death and translated fairly recently into English. Um, but he himself uh, was obsessed with this idea of, of botanizing on the asphalt, to reading the city and trying to understand what lay behind the city itself. Um, and of course, this, these are the, 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 the arcades, these, these these kind of architectural uh, pieces that were in a sense in their obsolescence uh, at the time. And he thought that the, it was in their obsolescence that they would reveal uh, their secrets. So the city for Benjamin was a city of marginal spaces that were in a sense in obsolescence and, and a city that was in many ways colonized by marginal figures. And this is the Pazajan work that uh, eventually was translated into English. Um, we don't know whether it was how he saw this um, his, was it whether it was a final manuscript? Not probably not. It was certainly is a collection of fragments. The way it's presented, of course, modernity itself is fragmentary, as as as, as Frisbee comments in Fragments of Modernity, um, and it's a series. He, Benjamin is basically a collector and a collector of aphorisms, of comments, as much as he was of other things, and that's what we find in our case project: a treasure trove of insights about the city itself. Um, and uh, <clears throat> but Krakow also was looking at the city, but maybe in a slightly different way. Um, and I want to quote you uh, a couple of comments um, that come from, from Krakow that re I think are really interesting in themselves. Spatial images are the dreams of society. Wherever the hieroglyphics of any spatial image are deciphered, there the basis of social reality presents itself. In other words, we can, we can interpret the city as a series of spatial images, a series of uh, which then themselves kind of uh, 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 you know, in a hermeneutic way become the hieroglyphics that we can decode and give us an insight to how the city itself operates. And importantly, he also makes a comment that surface level expressions by virtue of their unconscious nature provide unmediated access to the fundamental state of things. Conversely, knowledge of this state of things depends on the interpretation of these surface level expressions. What uh, Krakow is emphasizing here is that the is the unselfconscious way in which the city operates, and it's by studying those things that are often maybe unguarded moments when, when one can find out far more than simply sort of dealing with kind of the the, the high level research. And the city then um, is a kind of a bit like the slip of the tongue in Freud, or indeed the um, the optical unconscious in in, in uh, uh, 
I've got the expression, expression wrong here, but the, the idea that images can be themselves kind of convey things in an un, in a uh, in also an unselfconscious way, photographs and so on, things that are unintended can be revealed in some senses. And the city is this space of of, of kind of, of cultural um, operations that is operating often at a surface level. But it's because it is a surface level that we have access. And they reveal more than they may be intended to do. So. Um, <clears throat> And that term, the idea of hieroglyphics, is, is was behind a book that I edited, two thousand and two, um, which Graham contributed to. In fact, two essays, two very good essays, to uh, hieroglyphics of space, uh, reading and experiencing the modern metropolis. Um, so, and, and I would also mention that in rethinking architecture, um, there are some essays, both all by all four thinkers that I mentioned today. So Walter Benjamin, Adorno, Zimmel, and also Krakauer. In, in there, and the, there are two essays by uh, by Krakow, which I would say the hotel lobby is a particularly important example. Um, so, but, but but there are differences. There are differences in 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 Benjamin's approach and, and Krakow's approach. Um, for Benjamin, there was particular individuals, uh, particular um, archetypal individuals who were somehow um, highly representative of the modern metropolis, the, the flaneur um, on the left-hand side, the kind of disinterested observer who records his observations about this, about the, about the onslaught of modernity, in many ways resists that onslaught. Um, famously, the flaneur would, there was a story of a flaneur taking a, a turtle uh, for, for a turtle um, um, for a walk. Um, and, and by walking slowly uh, was in some senses um, uh, resisting the onslaught of modernity. Then there's a rag picker, and indeed the prostitute, who becomes a very interesting <clears throat> character for Benjamin, because not only has the commodity been been fetishized, been sexualized, as it were, uh, in modernity, but also sex itself has become commodified. And the the prostitute, in many ways, is that uh, the, the very embodiment there of the commodification of sex. And whereas for Benjamin, there are these individuals that he he focuses on. In, in some senses, in Krakow, uh, he, 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 he has a more sense of a kind of group identity, particularly not necessarily focusing on particular individuals, but rather looking how, how, in, how people themselves in the metropolis become this kind of, um, uh, these kind of disinterested people that uh, are part of this, are somewhat anonymous. Um, and he talks about, especially in the, his essay on the, um, <clears throat> um, uh, on, 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 um, uh, uh, um, his essay on, on the hotel lobby, um, uh, 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 remnants of individuals slip into the nirvana of relaxation, faces disappear behind newspapers and the artificial continuous light illuminates nothing but mannequins. And they think this sums up in many ways his whole approach towards um, uh, modernity, an abstract sort of existence um, in which individuals have been hollowed out and are simply, in a sense, um, uh, 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 mannequins, um, uh, and it's and he contrasts it in this essay. He contrasts it to the church, where there is a kind of a some sort of spiritual basis of it. But compared to the church, there are certain things in the hotel lobby that are, can be seen as similar, but ultimately it is completely different. It's about this kind of space of vacuity of existential homelessness. These are these anonymous people with an anonymous city um, that represent in many ways what modernity has bequeathed to us. In some <laughs> senses, they are the blase individuals, as it were, um, that Georg Simmel refers to in the metropolis and mental life. Um, and, and we can see it also in, in um, uh, Edward Hopper paintings. These are slightly later, of course, than when Krakow, but you can see this in these kind of uh, moments that, that he captures. And that previous image I would say is also uh, Edward Hopper, and, and this image of this kind of, I don't know, hamburger store or something like that, where you see this kind of lone individual on his own uh, in this kind of, this, this anonymous kind of space of the city um, where where it is a space of abstraction, where people circulate, much as Zimmel had put, as it described it, like the, the money itself in this disinterested abstract fashion, that itself, this is the kind of quintessential space, as it were, of modernity. Um, we can make a contrast between um, the image on the right hand side. This is the um, uh, this is the the the, the, um, uh, the the kind of the restaurant the the uh, in the um, Bauhaus Dessau, um, uh, which still operates as a kind of cafeteria um, for students there. 
And this abstraction that uh, we can see in terms of modernist architecture, in this case, the, the architecture of Gropius, um, and contrast it to the left-hand side, the only image that we have of, what, of Benjamin's um, of a sort of 19th century uh, interior, a kind of uh, a space which is, in which you were kind of cosseted. Uh, he describes it almost like the velvet folds of an instrument case where you are kind of, in a sense, comforting, reassuringly uh, enclosed within this kind of uh, space, this cocoon, in a sense. Um, and that is very different from the kind of space of modernity, the abstraction, as it were, of modernity. Now, it might give the impression by making this contrast that really both Benjamin and Krakow were themselves um, critical about modernity, but that's not necessarily the case. Although Benjamin, it's to say, at least to my reading, is a bit ambivalent. Um, much of his writing, like even the, the work of art in the age of mechanical re reproducibility, um, is a little bit ambiguous. Is Benjamin um, for the destruction of aura or is he against it? Um, it's not so clear. And it's also possibly it's, it's easy to confuse this in a sense with 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 um, um, also to, to confuse uh, uh, a Krakow as being a kind of critic of modernity. What I would say is, in fact, that Krakow was in some senses um, a, a real um, a believer in, in modernity. And in some senses, modernity hadn't gone far enough. Um, and this brings me to my, my next point in the sense that there is a difference also, I would say, between the work um, between Fritz Lang's Metropolis and the way in which Krakow um, treats the metropolis. Um, we, here we have these two individuals um, on the left, Maria, um, the human Maria, and also on the right, the robot Maria that substitutes for, that actually behaves and looks exactly like Maria in the movie. Um, and they seem to be opposite, operate the opposite pole. In other words, there's one that is all about sort of the human, all about abstraction and so on, the seemingly modern world, but actually it's maybe slightly different here in, in Krakow. What, what you can see on the left-hand side, which is a really a, a, an extraordinary kind of almost religious image here of, of Maria holding out the hands a bit like a priest, almost like Christ on the crucifix in the background, the candles. This is very much a kind of image of a slightly sort of a religious understanding of Maria to be contrasted with the abstract empty shell, as it were, of a, the robotic Maria on the right-hand side. But for Krakow, this wasn't necessarily the case. Krakow was interested in some senses by how the world on the right, in other words, the, the, the world of modernity had been colonized by the mythic, but not in the sense that Benjamin had been seeing, whereas where he saw it in terms of the dialectic of the enlightenment, where myth was always associated with rationality and the more rational became, the more society um, uh, in, in, uh, welcomed or, or encouraged the mythic. Um, for Benjamin, the biggest myth was to assume that we had avoided myth in moving into a modern age. The modernity, as Graham Gillock uh, points out so, so, uh, so, so, so beautifully in his book, Myth of Metropolis, the modern metropolis in particular was enshrouded in myth. We don't escape myth. Um, rather, uh, myth is always there. But Krakow is slightly different in my view anyway, that he saw that modernity itself uh, brought with it, the emptiness, the abstraction of uh, modernity brought with it certain religious and spiritual traits. So let me just briefly mention, I know that Graham's gonna talk about this too, um, the Tiller Girls, which I think in many ways sums up his approach towards modernity and the problems that come with this kind of, the abstraction of modernity. It's not as though for, for Krakow, these, um, these individuals are actually modern enough. <clears throat> his problem is that somehow in this world in which we, the, um, we the, the modernity in which we operate, this space of abstraction has been colonized by the mythic. Um, and, and we have a form of what he calls ratio, which is a form of rationality. And it's kind of murky form of rationality that comes with capitalism that is not rational enough. It is one, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, rather that has been colonized by the mythic. So let me just play you um, uh, uh, a bit of the, uh, um, uh, the Tiller Girls dance routine. Um, So it's in this abstraction that you can see something else uh, emerging, uh, something else emerging that is quite quite different. And we can compare this to Busby Berkeley and so on. It's it's something of the time, and, and the very abstraction of this is what allows uh, for something else to take hold. Um, uh, the, the abstraction becomes colonized. The empty shells become colonized by something else. So let me just read out. Uh, a few, uh, this is actually my text, I should say, this is my interpretation from Millennium Culture. 
But let me read out what I've, had written, what I've written about this, um, <clears throat> about the Tiller girls. Arms, legs, and torsos had become part of an overall composition. The synchronized movements of the Tiller girls echoed the clockwork mechanism, mechanisms of the factory. And we can think here about possibly about uh, the movie Metropolis, where, where individuals um, uh, become part of the, the, the clockwork mechanism of the factory itself or the, or the, 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 the power station, whatever it is we were seeing. We become cogs in the wheel, as it were. Everyone had become absorbed within a Taylorite domain, like ants working towards the common goal. They had been, been disciplined, straightjacketed into a single corporate entity whose ultimate manifestation is to be found in the ethos of the contemporary corporate company. Yet it'd be wrong to assume that this abstract, abstract rationality had led to a demythologization of society. With, with capitalism, the precise opposite had occurred. Capitalist thinking, according to Krakauer, bypasses the human and disappears into the void of the abstract. And it is this abstraction that creates space for the spiritual. Abstraction promotes an empty formalism, a naturalistic domain protected from the insights of reason itself, but exposed to the unrepressed dark forces of nature. These dark forces do not constitute nature proper, but rather a, a hollowed out empty shell, vacuated of true nature and ready to be colonized by the mythic. Somewhat paradox paradoxically then, abstract rationality tends to invite various mythic traits. That's an important comment. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and finally, it is from this perspective that we might see that the Tiller girls with their synchronized abstract movement are governed not by reason, but by the mythological. Masquerading as the technological, the efficient, they lapse into the mythic. The Tiller girls and likewise the mass ornament of stadium spectacles where thousands of individuals are choreographed into an overall display reveal all too accurately <coughs> the, uh, the, the capacity of the masses in an era of industrialization to be caught industrialization to be caught up in various myths, not least the most insidious of them all, the myth of the fatherland. And I think behind all this, we can see lurking a concern um, about what we see here. Um, the uh, here the Brandenburg Gate with the Nazis um, marching through. And on the left hand side, the mass ornament, what I think is the, probably the most important um, book that Krakow produced, and certainly the essay, the mass ornament, being the most important essay in that particular book. Um, and you can see how, for, for um, at least on the cover of this book, the Tiller girls make an appearance. There is something that is uh, that is there that not only links the Tiller girls to the marching, the, 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 the marching as it were, um, of, of, the, of, the, of the Nazis in this particular parade on the right-hand side, but also to the kind of the, 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 the way in which modernity eventually lent itself to something that was to kind of something horrific that was to emerge in Germany in the 1930s. Um, and there's a difference, I would say, and I, 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 I'm sure that Graham's going to also comment on this. Uh, for me, there's a slight difference between um, the approach that Benjamin takes um, towards um, uh, towards fascism in terms of the aestheticization of politics um, and I think the, the, the approach that the Krakow takes. So this is the um, Nuremberg rally where we see this sublimely beautiful cathedral of light that is um, uh, uh, created by taking these searchlights and pointing them up into the sky. Um, an astonishing uh, display that was choreographed by an architect, by Albert Speer. It was not only was it choreographed by an architect, it was recorded by Lenny Riefenstahler, a filmmaker, and 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 in the and, and the, the also the the actually the outfits of of the of, of the of, of the uh, of the SS, the outfits of, of, of the of the the of the, of the the troops, as it were, um, were designed by Hugo Boss. This was an extraordinary aesthetic gesture. And let's not forget that Hitler himself trained as an artist. There's something strange going on there. And Benjamin makes this comment that is really intriguing. It was the basis of my book, Anesthetics of Architecture. Fascism tends towards an aestheticization of politics. All efforts to make politics aesthetic culminate in one thing, war. Well, there's a lot more to be said about the theme of aestheticization of politics, but it's something that Benjamin recognized he saw it in this kind of these kind of these kind of spectacles, and he predicted absolutely accurately that it would lead to war. Krakow was maybe a little different in the way that he would approach things. Um, 
uh, he he saw it in terms of the mass ornament um, and in some sense in terms of the mythologization of society, the mythologization of this abstract thing. What I want to finish off with is is to float the idea um, that really there is something and then Krakow a message about the present that is really interesting. Um, in other words, the way in which maybe what we what he was talking about has become even more extreme in our contemporary condition. The idea that the abstraction can lead to mythologization, the idea that it encourages um, some kind of uh, religious take on things can lead to something almost as disturbing or maybe even more disturbing, let's say, than was happening in the 90s and 30s in Germany. And that is, in some senses, the growth of a kind of a not rationality or, or logic, but rather a kind of belief system where we know we know that from a kind of purely logical or rational point of view that Trump lost the election, and yet many of his disciples, and I use the term sort of disciples kind of meaning uh, in a particular, with, with a certain intent, uh, many of the disciples get caught up in this kind of cult of the individual, a cult that believes or believes in him. And I want to contrast the notion of belief as a kind of a kind of religious uh, mythological, so myth mythologized, mythologized, mythologized sort of view of the world and the abstraction of rationality itself. The problem about modernity that it was enshrouded in myth of Kobenimin, and the problem is uh, with, with Krakow that is it encourages the mythic. And it's precisely this kind of, this danger of the kind of cult of personality, of, of, of believing in things rather than actually kind of working within a logical framework that allows <clears throat> so many people to believe that the election was lost from Donald Trump and the kind of the way in which he was treated in some sense by his kind of followers um, in this kind of alleluia kind of very seemingly to my mind anyway, highly religious sort of view of his supporters who believe in him. They believe that in, in the, even though the, actually the evidence suggests that it was never, it, that he didn't lose the election, they still think that he, he, that he won, it was stolen from him. <clears throat> so here we have, I want to leave you with two, two final slides. Here we have, um, uh, Trump, um, and of course, Trump himself comes from Germany. Um, his father um, emigrated to the States from, from Germany. To see Trump himself um, here addressing uh, the masses, addressing the mass ornament, should we say, addressing <clears throat> his believers, his fervent followers, and then to contrast that with Adolf Hitler here seen addressing uh, a rally, not a political rally, but a rally, a military rally, and their parallels, to my mind, are disturbingly um, obvious. Can we see in Trump, in other words, the realization of precisely what Krakauer was trying to draw attention to back in the 1930s? I'm gonna um, leave it at that. I'm gonna leave my screen on, um, uh, uh, um, on um, so that Graham can um, uh, talk himself. Um, let me just move on to this. Okay. Um, yeah, this is the first of your slides, Graham. So um, I'm going to um, pass on um, to Graham and um, <clears throat> invite him to to offer his contribution. And I hope that I haven't said uh, too much that encroached on what you were going to say. But I, let's see. I think that we'll be. I think we kind of vaguely agree on these things. But it'd be interesting to see how how you have a slightly different take on this. And I defer to your much greater knowledge. I've not written a book on Krakow. I'd be. I'm a an amateur. Uh, I'm in both senses. I really love the work of Krakauer, but I'm more of a tourist, shall we say, than a, a true scholar. So, Graham, please, so welcome, and it's great to, to see you again. Thank you, Neil, and uh, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, and first of all, thank you for inviting me to take part again in this uh, session. Uh, it was great fun doing the sessions with you last time on Benjamin and, and Baudrillard. And um, so it's a real pleasure, it's a real honor uh, for you to invite me here and to take part again. So thank you for that. And thank you to everybody who, who's joined us um, and or who clicks onto this and uh, watches this through. And I hope, I hope they enjoy uh, and get uh, a lot from, from this session. Um, and yes, Neil, you have stolen one of my best lines, I think, actually. Um, but anyway, um, you're going to kindly sort of click click through these for me. And some of these things are going to go over some of the things that you've already said so eloquently. Um, but I hope this will be a slightly different take on some of those things. So as you, as you rightly mentioned, uh, Neil Krakauer himself uh, trained in Darmstadt as an architect, 
and then practiced briefly uh, just at, towards the end of the First World War. As an architect, he designed a, a kind of layout for a cemetery, actually, as one of his tasks and, uh, in, in Osnabrück, where he worked. So I kind of thought I might start with this, which was um, given his own experience as an architect, what might Krakauer say to the budding architect of today who might tune in and watch this video? Moving on to the next slide. Do something else um, is perhaps not the most uh, inspiring <laughs> or uh, promising opening. Um, but I think this is precisely what Krakow would say, given that he himself switched from architecture to uh, working as a journalist for the Frankfurter Zeitung. Um, so he, he himself opts out of working as an architect um, to do something else, to move into the realms of perhaps philosophy, uh, cultural theory, um, certainly as a kind of sociologist though as well. My own background is in sociology, so that's where I'm coming from rather than from philosophy here. But before we take that message too seriously and you decide that Krakow has nothing to say for architecture, that would itself would be a mistake. We move on to the next slide because I think Krakauer's work, if we think of architecture as about the distribution, uh, the configuration of space, of bodies, of materials, of senses and perceptions. If we think about architecture as, as, as a way of organizing, orchestrating, uh, and bringing together these elements, then I would say that Krakauer's work is profoundly architectural and his, his thinking, his writing, always is concerned precisely with notions of configuration, uh, spatial layouts, spatial patterns, um, not only at the level of the materials, of, of, of structures, of forms, the built environment, but also in particular of bodies and their arrangement, as we'll come on to see. Um, and I kind of like this idea of, uh, this is from Strassen in Berlin, which is a, a collection of essays, again, published um, posthumously, um, like the mass ornament. We've already seen this uh, quote in the, the English that, that Niels presented. Die Räumbilder der Träume der Gesellschaft, wo immer die Hieroglyphen irgendeines Raumbilders entziffert ist, dort bietet sich der Grund der Sozial -Wirklichkeit, sozialen Wirklichkeit. Da. So uh, spatial images are the dreams of society. Wherever hieroglyphs of a spatial image are deciphered, there the fundamental ground of social reality presents itself. So this idea then of decoding or deciphering urban space, that space itself is something to be read, that something uh, like a rabus or a picture puzzle that we need to interpret or examine in some way, that it reveals some, uh, some unconscious structuring principles even of social order. This idea of spatial hieroglyphs or hieroglyphics of space, and we've seen the took this as a title of uh, an edited collection, is what I want to kind of pursue today. And I hope it comes through in uh, what I have to say over the next few minutes. And I'm going to go, just going to prompt this question because I'm going to try and answer it, hopefully, at the end. I'm not, I'm not totally convinced about whether I, my answer is persuasive or not, but I'm going to put it out there and maybe this is something we can discuss. If Krakow is interested in a hieroglyphics of space, then what is the Rosetta Stone? What is, what is it that will allow us to interpret or unlock these, uh, these hieroglyphs, these uh, picture writings so we move on and i think uh, neil was absolutely right to point to the similarities and differences between uh krakow and benjamin um and of course one of the main uh, things about both of them were of course that they stood in some ways outside formal uh, academy as such uh, no, neither of them were ever really employed 
by a university or held academic posts, but always instead were reliant on uh, the writings of uh, their own uh, writings in terms of journalism. Krakow worked for the Frankfurt Zeitung for many years, for example. And they also sort of orbited around, but were um, Benjamin right at the end of his life, but Krakow never fully integrated into the uh, Frankfurt Institute for Social portion, which celebrates its 100th anniversary this year, um, and which uh, we sometimes uh, understand by the term the Frankfurt School, which was then uh, under the directorship from the 19. Um, 30s of, uh, of, of Max Horkheimer, and which uh, Theodore Adorno was, of course, a, a key thinker. So they were kind of outsiders, in a way, both outside the academy and outside the institute. And I think that's kind of a really interesting uh, aspect, because um, on the one hand, it, it, it really um, drives their production, both in terms of uh, where they're writing, where they're publishing, it creates a kind of freedom, of course, perhaps, for them to articulate their ideas. But of course, it also creates enormous pressures in terms of uh, financial uh, and living uh, possibilities as well. So these two things both are uh, concerned with kind of eking out a kind of impecunious existence throughout uh, their times, particularly when they are in exile in Paris. Uh, in the 1930s. Benjamin, uh, of course, committed suicide in 1940, and at that particular time, he was relatively unknown, uncelebrated, but is now revered as one of the most profound and original thinkers of the 20th century. I think he's rightly revered in those terms. Krakow's sort of uh, posthumous uh, reception, though, has been, as Neil sort of mentioned, not as enthusiastic. And I think one of the reasons for this is because his works, his Anglophone works in particular, um, his two books on film, 1947, uh, From Caligari to Hitler, and then 1960, uh, Theory of Film, The Redemption of Physical Reality. Um, these two books, which I will kind of say have been much misunderstood and much maligned, um, did not endear himself to film theory at the time. They were rejected as simplistic. They were rejected as naive. Um, and it is through their negative reception that Krakow has suffered enormously uh, in terms of reception in the Anglophone Academy. So I want to try and hopefully, um, by bringing Krakow's work to the attention of more people, um, that we can contribute, that I can contribute in some small way to some kind of restitution, uh, a recovery of this um, and a spreading of the word, if you like, that Krakow has fascinating and important things to tell us. Um, and I think basically both Benjamin and Krakow, why am I fascinated with them? Because for me, their experience of a catastrophic world is... Uh, finds echoes so much uh, and its resonance in our own world of catastrophe as well. Um, moving on. If we can, Neil. Yeah, lovely. So their world is very much our world. I think that's what I want to say. Um, here's some background to Krakow. As we know, he was born in Frankfurt and Mine. Uh, 1889. He serves very briefly with the Mainz Foot Artillery in the First World War, um, trains as an architect. He then gives up architecture to become a journalist. He works for the Frankfurter Zeitung, um, writing uh, feuilleton pieces and short essays, etc. He becomes an editor with the Frankfurter Zeitung and moves uh, in 1929, 1930, to Berlin to edit the cultural pages there. He produces over a thousand pieces of writing for the Frankfurter Zeit of all kinds of things, reviews, essays, uh, covering films, covering uh, theatre performances, covering forms of entertainment, uh, buildings, uh, places in the city, 
whole wide range of journalistic pieces. Um, he moves to Paris, uh, escapes to Paris uh, in 1933, um, and spends the next eight years there working on a book on Jacques Offenbach, which comes out in 1937, and also on a study of totalitarian propaganda, uh, which was commissioned by the Institute for Social Research by, by Horkheimer, um, but were then eventually unpublished in the uh, Zeitschrift for Social Portion, which is the House Journal. 1941, he escapes as late as 1941, April 1941, he has managed to escape from Marseille um, and uh, sails to New York, where he spends the rest of his life. And he dies in New York in 1966. If we move on. So uh, again, Neil has already given us some, some many of the, the kind of important writings by him. Um, and Krakow's a fascinating figure because um, his early works, many of his early works, which are, which are unpublished, certainly untranslated, um, huge essays on various aspects of uh, the self, the personality, um, and uh, the relationship between science and uh, the modern world, um, written uh, very early, and one of the one of these is a, a, a really fascinating study on his former teacher Gail Zimmel and the Spirit of Our Time, which uh, remains unpublished, and a sort of fragment from this is in the Mass Ornament Collection. He writes uh, uh, one of the first key studies of the detective novel, again, and untranslated, again, unpublished in his lifetime, uh, from which the uh, short essay that Neil mentioned on the hotel lobby is found. The detective novel is for him a, a kind of a exemplary instance of a kind of rationalized world uh, and a world of uh, profane, uh, experiences and profane spaces in the city, a model of the working as of the intellect in, in the figure of the detective who solves the puzzle of the crime through uh, rational thinking and through the amassing of uh, evidence um, and the applying, if you like, of rational insights into, into the case. The Mass Ornament essay itself comes out in the Frankfurter Zeitung in 1927. And another series of writings come out just shortly after that, a series of studies of white collar workers in Berlin, to which uh, Krakow was just about to move, called the Angestellte. An Angestellte is, is a particular sort of category of bureaucratic employee in Germany. Um, and Krakow was fascinated by this rise of a new kind of white collar workforce in Berlin, a shift in the class composition and division of labor in society. And he's interested in produces this kind of study of white collar workers as the new dominant uh, force within society. And that comes out, as I said, as a series of, uh, uh, as a series within the Frankfurt title, but then it's published separately as this book, Die Angestellten. In uh, Parisian exile, um, we see kind of two key studies coming out, as I already mentioned, one on totalitarian propaganda. We're going to come back to that, which was unpublished this time. And then a study of the composer Jacques Offenbach, uh, 19th century composer, and Jacques Offenbach and the Paris of his times. I'll come back to the significance of that. A book which both Benjamin and Adorno hated. Um, Interestingly, comes out, of course, at a similar time while Benjamin himself is working on 19th century Paris. And there are some very interesting parallels, many, many interesting parallels between the Offenbach book and Benjamin's own work, firstly on the arcades um, and then on uh, the poet Charles Baudelaire, both trying to capture uh, Paris as a sort of center of a new modernity uh, during the uh, Second Empire. Then the books that are published in, in, uh, in, in English, originally in English, um, uh, following uh, Krakow's 
uh, exile or flight from Europe and exile then in the United States from Caligari to Hitler, Psychological History of German Film, 1947, and then Theory of Film, The Redemption of Physical Reality from 1960. And I'll come back to these, uh, to these film books um, later on. So let's move on, Neil. So I'm going to take as a kind of point of departure here, um, and a bit of shameless plugging here. My own most recent um, work, which was on a co-edited anthology of Krakow's writings on the theme of propaganda, and this uh, includes some uh, excerpts from his actual study, um, 160-page study on totalitarian propaganda itself. But that was only one of several pieces of writing. So this uh, edited collection of his writings, which I did with uh, Jeho Kang and John Abramite, uh, has come out recently. And it's uh, trying to attempt to sort of like locate Krakow's work uh, in a particular, uh, as a particular way in terms of its resonance for our understanding of propaganda, perhaps propaganda today as well. And again, we'll come back to that. And we've already seen how Neil's tried to articulate some of the insights of Krakauer in terms of the mass ornament and mythology uh, with respect to this. And I'm gonna come back to that as well. But I wanna suggest that I kind of pursue three key themes in Krakauer's work. And the first is the sort of, a, the kind of overarching theme of the idea of modernity as a disenchanted world. And by that dis my notion of disenchantment, I mean a world of rationalization, and but a world also in which that the duality of that term, the ambiguity of that term, disenchantment, a world, yes, without magic, without myth, perhaps, but disenchanted also in a world in which uh, to be disenchanted is to be uh, disabused of um, happiness in some way, uh, to have one's expectations, one's hopes frustrated in some way. So the notion of disenchantment here, which comes, of course, from uh, Max Weber's work, the notion of a disenchantment is a kind of very ambiguous term for this world that has lost something as well. Um, the second key uh, aspect I want to think mention is this notion of the masses themselves, because I think the notion of the masses is absolutely central to Krakow's work and central to this idea of a disenchanted world. And here I'm going to talk a little bit about the anger shell. And then finally, most importantly, the notion of popular culture, popular mass culture. And we're gonna come back to this uh, mass ornament essay, which Neil has already flagged up and which I think he rightly flags up as, uh, as an absolutely key uh, essay for us, for the understanding of uh, Krakauer. So if we move on. So as Neil's already mentioned, this idea of the disenchanted life world is drawn from the works of Gail Zimmel, uh, who was, as Neil mentioned, a teacher of Krakauer and echoes the kind of ideas that are contained in this 1903 essay, Metropolis and Mental Life. And here we see Zimmel trying to articulate a particular version or view of the modern city as a site of uh, abstraction, as a site, city of calculation. Abstraction in two key ways, the circulation of money as the abstraction of value, and also the importance of clock time, the abstraction of time itself. And this notion of a rationalized uh, city that's placing endless demands upon us, the city of crowds, the city of traffic, the city of movement, the city of overstimulation produces, uh, as Neil pointed out, this blasé personality. But the key word uh, I'm gonna take from this is not so much the blasé, but the notion of indifference. And for Zimmel, the idea that the modern individual becomes indifferent to the qualities and qualitative distinctions between things. That in this world of abstraction, this world of abstraction is also a world of quantification. That instead of being attuned to the subtleties and differences of qualities, we become preoccupied instead with the differences in terms of quantities, of numbers, of amounts. And it is this loss of a sense of quality and qualities, this 
uh, that is absolutely fundamental, I think, to the work of Krakauer. For Krakauer, the modern is a kind of gray, monochromatic uh, world in which um, sort of all forms of, sort of spirituality, all forms of uh, transcendence have been hollowed out and lost. If we move on, Neil, this is a world precisely of indifference, of disenchantment, of a dispiritedness. Um, and this is found uh, in uh, this discussion of uh, the hotel lobby, for instance, in the detective, uh, in his discussions of the detective novel. And this, uh, this is kind of indifference, this notion of indifference finds itself expressed in particular kinds of urban spaces. The hotel lobby is a kind of quintessential expression or locus classicus of such profane spaces. But he holds a whole sort of series of terms that we might think about in relation to this. Those spaces of waiting, for instance, those spaces of boredom, in between spaces, Sishenroin describes them as spaces of transit. Ben, uh, Krakow himself also writes on the arcade, the Linden arcade, in Berlin rather than the Parisian arcades. Spaces that are uh, without meaning, spaces where we spend our time but have no real significance for us, spaces where we are bored, spaces where we experience tedium. And he sees these not only as um, sort of spaces within the city, but also in an ex existential sense, as well as um, that we are, if you like, perpetually in a state of waiting of anxious anxiety uh, and anxiety and anxious expectation of something to happen, the new, whatever it may be. Spaces where we exist in kind of uh, uneasy indifference and anxious indifference to each other as well. He describes these as spaces of where we, where we are neben einander, next to each other, but not with each other, lacking sociality, lacking connection with others. And it is this world of disconnection, this world of waiting, this world that is uh, emptied of meaning, emptied of significance, this disenchanted, dispirited realm that is sort of underlies Krakow's view of modern urban experience. We move on. And we see here the term non-place, which comes from the writings of the French uh, anthropologist uh, Marco J, of course. Krakow is a sort of pioneer of non-places. Right? And here we see a 1920s uh, hotel lobby. And I think the interesting thing for me is the kind of the arrangement, the spatial arrangement here of the chairs. Notice how they um, uh, bespeak a particular uh, sociability, or rather, of course, the complete lack of sociability. Here we can precisely be uh, neben einander without being mit einander. If we move on. So this idea of a sort of hollowed out, rationalized world, of course, chimes particularly with uh, the idea of instrumental reason that's uh, developed by uh, Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno in Dialectic of Enlightenment. And kind of Krakow anticipates this with this key term here, the ratio. The ratio is this precisely this notion of an instrumental, a world of instrumental reason. And he sees as the kind of bearers of this instrumental reason, uh, the white collar workers. And the white collar workers of the city Berlin are precisely um, it's uh, the white collar workers are precisely the figures of the ratio in two ways. Firstly, they are uh, bureaucratic workers. They are workers in offices who uh, they're, they're kind of their lives are spent in the sort of technical disciplines and structures of the office apparatus, which Weber I himself identifies as the sort of uh, preeminent a rational division of labor, the rational division of organization. So on the one hand, they're the bearers of the ratio, uh, and on the other, they're its agents. They're the ones who subject all other areas of life to uh, rational control 
and administration. This is the administered world and the world of administration. And Krakow's journalistic practice, of course, has an interesting relationship with these, uh, this public, because on the one hand, they are precisely the public he is writing for. And on the other, they are precisely the public he is writing about. So it is the experience of these white collar workers, these rationalized agents and bearers that uh, is, the, is, is bound up with uh, Krakow's journalistic practice for the Frank Post title. What are the hallmarks of this? I think twofold. One is that he describes them, and this is a key phrase he uses, is he describes them as geistig obdachlos. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but what does that mean? Spiritual shelterlessness or spiritually shelterless. This is how he describes these um, new uh, tiers of white collar workers. Why? Well, he says for two reasons. One is that they are, or they kind of occupy this sort of in-between position um, bet between, on the one hand, the kind of uh, traditional old, old bourgeoisie, the professions, the educated, uh, those who have culture. These figures, these are those who have not made it to these higher echelons. They don't have this status. They don't have this social status. They don't have this social, they don't have this education on the one hand. On the other, however, they are no longer members of the working class as such, or certainly do not see themselves as members of the working class. And in that sense, they don't, they have neither this claim to the individual life of culture, nor the notion of a sort of proletarian, proletarian solidarity or political uh, solidarity. So on the one hand, they feel themselves despised, and on the other, they feel themselves uh, as in a position where they can exercise contempt over others. They are very much this kind of svishan class, this in between class is, is their very condition. The second aspect of this is that they lead these, because they lead these highly rationalized lives of disenchantment, um, and because they are spiritually shelterless in this sense, they are open to precisely to re-enchantment, to escapism, to the desires, to, to, to find their desires fulfilled in mass culture. Um, they are open to, to, the, to the dream factories of the pseudo realities that are created for them by cinema on the one hand, popular film, popular entertainment, and of course, the pseudo realities, as Krakow puts it, that are created by political figures as well, who appeal precisely to the, this, this particular class. And of course, this is the class from which um, National Socialists and Nazis drew their strength, uh, that, that class who saw themselves neither as um, the uh, upper middle classes nor um, having any sense of solidarity for the proletariat. Okay, if we move on. And this leads us then to this notion of popular culture itself and the role of popular culture, the role of popular culture for the salaried masses in actual fact. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to say this, I've, I've said this before, and, and, and people, some people take umbrage at this because they always present me with that Benjamin is, is another case in point. But, I, but, but for me, Krakow really is the one figure, perhaps Lermontal as well, um, associated with the Frankfurt School, who really takes popular culture seriously. And he's interested in popular culture, not merely as ideology, but as some way in which by exploring popular culture, we can come to understand modernity. Um, his focus, of course, is on film and photography. We'll come back to his writings on film in a moment. Um, but he also presents us with three really interesting, different, but perhaps connected ways of exploring and interrogating mass culture. The first of those is as surface level expressions, the Tilligals, we'll come on to that. The second is a form of, of reading a society through the life of an individual, he calls it the societal biography, and the, this is what he uses to analyze Jacques Offenbach. And the third is through kind of an understanding of sort of collective unconscious being revealed, dream images, we might call these, revealed in film. And this is the basis of his book, 
Caligari to Hitler. So if we move on. Neil's already kind of quoted from this. Uh, this is a kind of key opening to the mass ornament essay from 1927. Um, and I'm just going to just sort of reprise just of the beginning of it. The position that an epoch occupies in a historical process can be determined more strikingly from an analysis of its inconspicuous surface level expressions than from that epoch's judgments about itself. What does this mean? What it means for Krakauer, I think, is that to understand, to understand a society, we need to look at not, we don't have unmediated access to its fundamental constitution and construction and processes. We need to look precisely at what appears to be insignificant, what appears to be everyday, what appears to be banal, what appears to be of no particular significance or consequences. But it is precisely through an analysis of these things that we can actually see down into the depths of a society. So here we're operating with what I'm going to call a, a depth hermeneutic. And this is something that it gets, of course, from the work of Gail Zimmel itself. It is only through these surface level expressions that we can understand the deep seated processes that are taking place in our society. So we need, can only read the depth through the surface. And of course, by reading the depth, that then in turn illuminates the surface as well. Moving on. So the most obvious example of this is Krakow's reading of the Tiller Girls. Tiller Girls were a troupe of uh, performing dancers. Um, Krakow calls them American. They weren't American. They had just come from a tour in America when he sees them. Um, interestingly, they come from well, a few miles away from where I'm sitting right now. They were originally created in Manchester in England. Uh, they were created by John Tiller, uh, an uh, entertainment entrepreneur, uh, towards the end of the um, late, late 19th century, early 20th century. They originally performed um, at Blackpool at a sort of seaside resort in the northwest of England where factory workers would go and spend their week on holiday. And interestingly, they themselves, the, the, the young women themselves, were recruited from the factories. So interestingly, they move out of the kind of mechanized factory world into a mechanized dancing routine. Uh, that term dancing routine, uh, I think is kind of uh, says, says a lot, the idea of a, a routinization of dancing. Uh, so the Tiller Girls is an example precisely of one of these surface level expressions, which we're gonna come back to. But let's move on just for a moment to uh, this idea of a societal biography. And I just want to give you sort of a sense of this because I think these are kind of interesting ways of uh, different kinds of reading that, that Krakow engages in. And the idea of the societal biography, which is something that um, Adorno and Benjamin both scoffed at, I think is a really interesting idea. What Krakow tries to do in his book on Jacques Offenbach, Offenbach, a very popular composer of the operetta, of light music, uh, of uh, various stage shows, a kind of impresario of musical theatre during the uh, Second Empire in France, during the reign of Napoleon III. Um, Offenbach's music and uh, sort of, uh, tales of Hoffman, um, La Belle Hélène, uh, Orpheus in the Underworld, these uh, very popular um, uh, uh, musical forms. Um, Krakow argues that the operetta itself has a kind of particular resonance or significance within this particular society, a society which he describes as one of sort of fantasy, of daydreams, of phantasmagoria, of excess, of, uh, um, of comedy as well, of, of the unserious. Um, of playfulness. But what he tries to do then is to actually read a particular society and understand a particular society at a particular historical moment from the life of an individual. Um, interestingly, Krakauer actually applies this to Zimmel in his earlier writings, Zimmel and the Spirit of 
his time, the spirit of our times. But it's the idea that by studying a biography, by studying someone's life force, the success or otherwise of their works, that one can understand or expand out from that life into the life of a society itself. Now, there's some parallels in, the, in terms of the book with Benny Mizar Kay's project and, and the studies of Baudelaire, as I mentioned. But I think this idea, and I want you to think about this idea of the individual as a kind of monad, that the individual from an individual life, one can uh, unfold an entire society. Um, if we move on, because if you, we were thinking about that as a possibility, then you might want to think about this. If we were to repeat such a project, if we were to think about who would be our Jacques, Jacques Offenbach of the 21st century, um, who would it be? Um, and I've just got here kind of insert name and the insert society of their times. But I think it's a fascinating method. I'm not going to say much more about it, but I think it is a fascinating conception that we can read uh, a society out of a biography. Um, and I'm going to leave that one with you to think about as we move on to the next uh, idea, which is the idea of the dreams and dream images. And this, um, in particular, uh, is the basis of his book uh, on Caligari, Dr. Caligari, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari was a film, a uh, pacifist film from 19, well, pacifist anti-authoritarian screenplay that was made into a film in 1920 by uh, Robert Wiener. Um, it's a kind of classic of Weimar cinema now. But what was interesting about this film for, for Krakauer is that um, the screenplay itself was changed as the film was made. And what starts off as a kind of critique of this uh, figure, this devious figure of authority, a trickery, this charlatan, this ma uh, Montebank, this evil figure, uh, Caligari, who uh, has this um, uh, has his uh, this figure Cesare as his servant, uh, the sleepwalker who goes and murders. Uh, Caligari's enemies in the middle of the night. Um, that this figure of evil um, uh, is uh, meant to represent, uh, if you like, figures of authority, uh, figures of domination, figures of control. Uh, this is how the the, 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 the the original screenplay was conceived uh, by uh, Maya and Yanovitz. Um, but this is not how the film ends up. The film changes this anti-authoritarian slant by means of a framing device. And the framing device actually then is works to set, which uh, changes the beginning and the end, such that it's suddenly revealed that the, the person who is denouncing uh, Caligari actually is the inmate of an institution for the insane. Um, so this um, suddenly uh, changes the entire story um, and that in actual fact, what was this figure, Caligari, this figure of evil, becomes in actual fact, the benign uh, director of the institute, the manager of the hospital, the overseer of the hospital, who it is suddenly revealed then um, uh, now understands his patient and is now able to cure him of his uh, delusions and hallucinations. So by means of this framing device, uh, uh, Krakow argues what should have been an anti-authoritarian film becomes an endorsement of benign authority, such that the authors of the screenplay actually insisted that their names were taken off this screenplay. It's gonna be interesting, this idea of uh, a, a, a pacifist anti-war film about the First World War, um, Having its uh, having been, been transformed into something else, we move on to the next slide. Because uh, this evening, I think uh, Oscars are going to be announced, um, and this is precisely the reaction, certainly in Germany, that this film, uh, based on Remarque's novel *All Quiet on the Western Front*, this new film version, um, has uh, prompted in Germany that this anti-war epic 
has been turned into something else, a kind of Hollywood blockbuster and a whole series of changes have taken place in which the original uh, story has been completely lost. So anyway, that's just a kind of interesting contemporary resonance. I don't think anybody can uh, read about this, uh, the, 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 the reception of this film um, without thinking back to the uh, Krakow's reception of the Caligari book. But the key thing for Caligari then is that Krakow uses this film and looks at Weimar cinema then to see how recurrent motifs within film start to reveal uh, what he calls the sort of collective unconscious, a particular collective unconscious, a national uh, sensibility, if you like. And he argues that film itself is becomes a tool, a way of, a way of doing this depth hermeneutic, that by studying film as a surface level expression, we can see the kind of preoccupations, the values, the mores, the ideas, the ideologies of a particular society at a particular moment. By, stu by studying film and its recurrent motifs, by this he means popular film, it doesn't mean art house film, doesn't mean kind of a highbrow film. He's, by watching the films that are popular, he says that this will tell us something about the society in which they thrive, in which they're produced, in which they're consumed. And again, if we move on, I think Krakow provides an interesting way of thinking about film. And if film is a surface level expression, what might Hollywood films today and its blockbusters and, uh, and mega hits today, what might these kinds of films tell us about American society, for instance, and the way America sees itself in the world and understands itself in particular ways, particular heroic terms, for instance. Moving on. I want to focus though, on the mass ornament and take a, uh, and, and this will sort of lead us towards back to the notion of totalitarian propaganda. For Krakow, the Tiller girls are significant, important for a number of reasons. And, and, and Neil's already mentioned some of these that they present a kind of model of things like the fragmentation of the human body, the deroticization of the, the human body. They present a notion of disciplined bodies here, that the notion of discipline itself, synchronization, standardization. Um, John Tiller um, in, one, was wanted to ensure the same body shape, the same uh, coloring in terms of hairstyles and things like that for all, uh, all of the women who were part of the dance troupe to create this notion of a standardized, de-individualized spectacle a spectacle of disciplined bodies moving in time together, moving a particular tempo or rhythm. And we can think about rhythm itself as a kind of disciplining mechanism to keep in time uh, when we hear uh, rhythmic forms, it's just clap, clapping, for instance. When we hear clapping, we start to clap in time because rhythms, it's, rhythms themselves have a kind of disciplining role. And what the mass ornament shows, this dance troupe show, is for Krakow a triumph both of discipline as a spectacle and the, the celebration precisely of, of, of abstractness itself. That the patterns formed by the Tiller girls have no meaning beyond merely being patterns. That this is about the disappearance of the individual into uh, something bigger than the individual individual, in which the individual is shown to be of minimal significance, the totality, the mass itself is what is important. The mass that is moving, the mass that is um, synchronized, the mass that is standardized, the disappearance of the individual itself becomes an aesthetic spectacle. So this is de-individualization as some kind of entertainment. If we move on, here we see again uh, the Tiller girls, but we see this idea of these kind of synchronized dance forms uh, have become such an ever-present 
in our culture that we probably don't even think about them or think about what they're doing anymore. If we move on, we see them here, for instance, think about notions of uniformity and standardization here in the case of uh, different K-pop bands, for instance, which rely for their success on uh, notions of highly uh, synchronized forms of choreography and dance routines. Moving on, we see notions of synchronicity and standardization, the disappearance of the individual here. This is from the Beijing Olympic Games opening ceremony, for instance. And this is where we start to see the kind of mass spectacle uh, uh, of, of that Krakauer is talking about. Um, the way in which here the disappearance of the individual is itself becomes uh, aestheticized. We carry on. Here again, this formation of patterns. This is from uh, again from Beijing, but this time from the Winter Olympics, where these identically dressed uh, uh, individuals lose precisely that sense of being individuals. We move on. And here we see this notion of the celebration of patterns for their own sake, which express nothing other than this notion of a sort of a geometric form. These are empty forms in that sense. Moving on. And this notion of the mass ornament as a principle, I think is kind of quite interesting perhaps in, in the context of architecture, where this notion of reproduction of the identical, of the standardized, uh, this notion of similarity, this notion of uh, a sort of geometric regularity um, itself becomes an ornamental principle. When we often think about um, modern architecture or modernism in architecture and the international style as a stripping away of ornament about uh, form following function, a, a new functionality, a new brutalism, a sort of lack of decoration, a lack of ornamentation. But, but perhaps that's, um, from, if, we, if we look at the work of Krakauer, we can see that in actual fact, these forms do have a new kind of ornament and that ornamentation is itself uh, mass repetition and standardization, notions of identity and the lack of differentiation. Moving on. And here's just how this then becomes tied up with this notion from moves, we start to move from entertainment, everyday entertainment, into the notion of political spectacle. And these photographs are taken by the South Korean photographer, who I'd like to thank for these photographs, uh, No Sun Tag. And these are uh, a series of photographs that he took of spectacles performed in. Uh, North Korea. So if we move on. I think we see here the way in which individuals, individual bodies, the configuration of bodies, the spatial layout of bodies, the way bodies are dressed, the way bodies are formed, the way bodies are twisted and turned, moved and shaped, choreographed. Here we see them as the vanishing of the individual, the disappearance of the individual into. The anonymous mass. We're moving on. Again, here, sort of gymnastics, rhythmic gymnastics, in which the individuals start to disappear. In fact, the very notion of the human starts to vanish. These things start to look like abstract patterns in some way. Moving on. I think this is a very ironic one. Here, tennis is a highly kind of individualized sport after all most most you can play it with is like four of you playing doubles together and here we see we see we, we see this that this itself even an individualized sport like this is being now being turned into this highly uh massified de-individualized spectacle moving on And I think there's a, the, the, why is this significant? Why is this significant? Because this takes us to, and Krakow himself starts to cite his own uh, study, Mass Ornament, 
in his work uh, from 1936-1938 on totalitarian propaganda. And the key part of this idea is this notion of the eradication of the individual, this reduction of the individual subject to what he calls a mass and particle, a mass particle. Um, and this is also piled up with things like uh, the, the uh, denial of classes and denial of class interests, the appeal to uh, other collectives like uh, the people, for instance, or the Volksgemeinschaft. Um, this turning of individuals into the mass, of course, um, is, the, is in counterpoint to the heroization and the celebration of the one unique personality, namely the leader, the leader who appeals to emotion, who appeals to um, uh, who appeals uh, not to reason, but to prejudices, appeals to half-truths, appeals to lies, um, who celebrates spectacle, use of rallies, um, to make the mass, to make him feel good about himself, but also to make the mass feel good about itself. I think that one of the things that sort of Krakow is really interesting here uh, is that, that these kind of rallies, these gatherings, it's not just that they're there to worship at the feet of the chosen leader, but also in the very fact that they form a mass, that they are therefore part of something bigger than themselves, that they see that their own sharedness, if you like, of their views, that they are popular, that they are not on their own, that they are surrounded by other like-minded people, that this narcissism of the mass is also key to this, that I am part of something that is bigger than me, that the individual then not only is not a kind of, not simply a victim who is then disappearing into this mass, but they embrace this mass to become part of something. And this of course appeals very much to, of course, to the, precisely to um, the, uh, those who are spiritually shelterless, for instance. We've seen notions of repetition are important to this. And that wrote the way in which rhythm becomes disciplining. And Krakow talks about the way work, this works in terms of chanting and clapping, and the way in which sort of certain chants lock her up, build the wall, etc., become uh, important uh, slogans um, which uh, form part of populist rhetoric for instance. And he also talks about the notion of empty language. This is one of my, one of my favorite things, I think, in, in Krakow. And I'm just saying these things because I think they are incredibly prescient for understanding the politics of our time, as Neil's already mentioned. Empty slogans, my, my favorite, uh, of course, one could think about uh, Make America Great Again, um, which actually was not Trump's own slogan. I think that goes actually back to Reagan. Um, so it actually be like Trump's slogan should have been make America great again, again. But um, in actual fact, uh, my favorite is uh, uh, from the British experience of contemporary populist discourse, which is Brexit means Brexit, which is a beautiful example of a tautology and a beautiful example for me of how language ends up saying nothing because it could mean anything whatsoever. Moving on. And here we see um, some other uh, examples of the mass ornament, another kind of dancing, for instance. And this is uh, also from Nuremberg rallies that, that Neil has already mentioned. So for Krakow, there is a sort of continuity between the mass ornament in providing the masses, both those who are dancing and also those who are watching. Uh, as complementary to each other, uh, co-parasitic on each other. And another, if we move on, more disciplined bodies, the idea of disciplined bodies themselves, itself, the disciplined body as a form of spectacle and entertainment. Moving on. And here we see another sense of the mass in which the individual is completely eradicated um, in this uh, totality and is seen as insignificant and trivial. Moving on. 
And as Neil's already mentioned, that this itself becomes choreographed and orchestrated for the purposes of film uh, by Lenny Riefenstahl. Um, so this is uh, this notion of choreography and orchestration of leader and masses, leader and led. I think it's a really uh, interesting idea. And I think these terms, choreography and orchestration, are ones that I think are really important. What, in what ways can we think about these terms about the, as forms of the organization of space? The organization of space, the organization of bodies, the organization of materials, the organization of architecture, the organization of signs, the organization of symbols, the organization of sound, the bringing together of bodies that move, bodies that experience, bodies that feel themselves part of a crowd, that feel themselves to be involved that feel themselves to be present. This notion of orchestration and choreography is precisely the creation of spatial images. We move on. So, yes, Neil, we're going to come back to this notion of the aestheticization of politics. Benjamin famously says that fascism is the aestheticization of politics, the turning of politics into some kind of spectacle. And he contrasts this, he says, communism is the politicization of the aesthetic. Um, what is, what is what's Krakow's take on this? Well, I think the first thing I'd say is, it's already kind of mentioned in the title of that book, Film in Our, um, sorry, Theory of Film, uh, The Redemption of Physical Reality. Krakow's interested in this physical reality, physical reality, bodily reality of the mass. So here the notions of embodiment and rhythm are really important. So it's not just spectacle, it's the entire bodily involvement. So fascism, I'm gonna re re rewrite Benjamin a little bit here for Krakow. Fascism involves, I'm gonna say the synestheticization, the total bodily involvement of politics, but also a forgetting as well in the context of this uh, in the context of the mass, in the context of this dispirited world, in the context of this um, disenchanted world. This is about a forgetting of politics. This is about an, a world of indifference to politics as well. This is about an anesthetization, a deadening of the senses of politics. This is about the failure to look at the qualities of things, to take pleasure in numbers, to take pleasure in being part of a quantity, to be take pleasure in being a number among many others, a, a, an individual, not anymore alone, isolated, spiritually shelterless, but an individual who stands within the mass to lose oneself within the mass and feel oneself lost within the mass. This is what I'm going to call an anesthetization of politics, a kind of forgetting a numbness to the world. We move on. And this is where film comes in, actually. Film in his 1960 book, Film, Theory of Films, Physical uh, Redemption of uh, Physical Reality. Krakow starts off in the epilogue uh, to this book um, by kind of like rehearsing this idea from Zimmel of this gray world in which uh, monochromatic world of indifference and desensitization to the world. Krakow argues that film is transformative of this, that film has a kind of almost, we would almost say a kind of utopian promise. Film reveals the world in new ways to us. It reveals the world that seems to have disappeared, that we seem to have forgotten, that seems to be bland, bored, boring every day. That world is penetrated and shown to be full of new things, new possibilities, new experiences. The world is revealed to us anew, and part of this process is 
through a uh, term from Benjamin here, the optical unconscious, that which we see, but we never actually perceive as such. So he talks about investigating sort of microcosms, the, the way cameras penetrate and close up, the way cameras are able to slow down fast motion so we can see the motion, we can see the figures, we can see movement, or speed things up so very slow processes, the opening of a flower can be shown to us. The camera reveals the world to us again and restores our senses of the world. This is the promise of film. In other words, film itself works against or works to counter this anesthetization of politics, this forgetting, this sense, sense in which the, the way in which our senses are being deadened or dulled to the world around us, this revitalization of our curiosity, of our energies. Film renders visible what we did not or couldn't or even could not see before its advent. We literally redeem the world from its dormant state. It states a virtual non-existence by endeavoring to experience it through the camera. The cinema can be defined as a medium particularly equipped to promote the redemption of physical reality. This redemption then is a critical intervention in the world, the world that seems to be a world of dispirited, uh, dispirited individuals, dispirited masses um, of ornaments, um, of disenchantment. Last slide. Film helps us not only to appreciate our given material environment, but to extend it in all directions. They virtually make the world our home, Krakauer says towards the end of theory of film. In showing us the world again, showing us the world anew, in refreshing our senses, film shows us new possibilities. It uh, creates new. Uh, environments for us. It restores our sensibilities. It, re it rejuvenates us. The world becomes our home again, virtually, through the camera, cinematically, our home. Home precisely for the spiritually shelterless. For those who, this is again echoing Benjamin here in this phrase, those, um, those without hope, hope is given to us for those who, uh, for, for the hopeless, uh, Benjamin says uh, in his essay on uh, Goethe. Film reveals the city, reveals our world for us, brings us closer to that world, rejuvenates our senses, breaks with the forgetfulness, the amnesia and anesthesia of fascism, the anesthesia of our deadened senses, deadened by modernity itself. It makes us attuned to, it deciphers the world, the, the Rhyme Builder, it deciphers the hieroglyphics of space. The film camera is our Rosetta Stone. And I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. I know there's some questions in the chat. Um, Neil, I hope that was okay. Thank you. That was truly astonishing, Graham. That really, really remarkable. It, one of, I mean, probably one of the best lectures I've ever heard, certainly the best lecture on, on, on Krakow. I think you really brought Krakow alive. And um, really, I mean, it kind of, it drew, drew us, it, it drew him to our attention once more. And I think there is, there is, I could see that kind of Krakow, um, I mean, just as Benjamin, you know, has been overdone, but at the same time, there's more there. I think Krakow, really needs some more attention, especially, I think, within the architectural community. I think this is really, you brought that home in a, in a, a really beautiful way. And thank you so much. It was, I was thank, thank you. I, I want to, you know, one thing, I don't know, I, I'm not quite sure what, um, I, I, you know, it's kind of, I, I, I think in some senses that our views are aligned, but I'm always cautious about saying certain things. I know that there was a collaboration between Graham Harmon and Manuel Delanda, and Graham Harmon, thought that they were completely together on, on that collaboration and, and Mamor de Landa thought the opposite. It just showed how different they are. But I thought there, there were some things that I thought was really amazing. I, 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 I don't know if you know, I wrote a book called The Anesthetics of Architecture. And the mm -hmm. fact that you picked up on an anesthesia is something that was kind of close to my heart. I also, 
I, I, I took out some, my, my presentation was too long, my apologies, but I, I, it would have been longer if I would put in some of the slides that I would have done, which of course would even, I think, have pulled the rug through further because I was going to put in there the, the Beijing Olympics. I was going to put in there a North, um, North Korean spectacle. And actually, I, I also took out something that I wrote in my Millennium Culture book, which was an essay from the Tiller Girls to the Spice Girls. It wasn't quite from Tiller Girls to K-pop, but it was kind of mm. similar in, in many sort of ways. Now, I've, I've got a... I've got a bunch of questions that I want to kind of kick off with, and, and, and we've got some, uh, I think, my question in the chat as well. Can I also ask those who are following on YouTube if they would like to um, send in, in, a, in a, um, a question onto the chat there, and we can relay it to, to the Zoom um, audience here. Um, but maybe I, I could just kick off with one thing. That was, I mean, I was, as you were talking today, something came up which I hadn't really thought about, and, and that is that you, you yourself have been very instrumental in making comparisons between Benjamin and, and Baudria. And uh, um, I, 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 and I, I also made that in a mistake. In fact, this is part of the weakness of the book is trying to collapse one into the other. I think there's a big difference between Benjamin and Baudria. Um, but nonetheless, you make that sort of comparison. And as you were talking about sort of surface level impressions, I was thinking, well, why haven't we thought about Krakow in the context of postmodernism? Is you know the, mm. the surface, but the infinite depth of surface. And uh, and 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 I was wondering whether you'd made that comparison yourself between Krakow and Baudrillard since you've made the Benjamin Baudrillard um, comparison. That's a great question. Thank you, thank you, Neil. I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased you enjoyed it. And 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 uh, yeah, I, I, as you mentioned, you know, kind of I was thinking of your book. Uh, on the anesthetics of our, our anesthesia and architecture. Um, when, when, when I when I sort of when I was when I was writing this and thinking about this and as we got to the end, um, I think uh, I mean I, first of all I think that there are some really interesting ways in which we can think about uh, Krakow and, and postmodernism, postmodernity. Um, of course, Zimmel himself has been taken up by various postmodern theorists as well uh, and the Weinsteins were sort of uh, argue that, that Zimmel was, was a sort of proto postmodern figure in, in, in some ways. Um, and I think, I mean, I would say two things. I think there are a lot of things that are, would be really interesting to think about in terms of Krakow in relation to postmodernism. Uh, the notion of surface level expression, certainly, but I'll come back to that because I think that's actually where, that's where the difference really, really strikes home. Um, Taking surface level phenomena seriously is certainly a point of contact. And I actually think that there is, there's a really lovely essay in uh, the Mass Ornament collection called Calico World, which is precisely about a trip to the uh, film studios at Neu Babelsberg, uh, just outside Berlin, where he talks about uh, a kind of confected world uh, and this idea of a confected fake uh, simulation uh, world, a, a world completely composed of simulacra sitting happily side by side as he walks through the studios, you know, was a Western set next to a, 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 a space futuristic set next to a sort of 19th century interior next to a uh, sort of tropical rainforest or something like that. As he's moving through this, you know, uh, there is also, you know, it, may, it, it makes me think about Baudrillard's notion of, of simulacra. It makes me think about notions of hyperreal, um, etc. Uh, fictions, the way fictions um, and, and fantasies then impact back upon our understanding of, of 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 the real, if you like. So I think there's some really interesting ways in which we could we could think about that where i think krakow is 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 different um and where he would uh sit very uncomfortably with postmodernity is the the very notion of the depth hermeneutic that the surface is a way of accessing that which is not surface anymore and it is precisely for this reason about um, exploring the deep-seated uh, structures, whether they be uh, of society, whether they be of the sort of social collective. Um, this is very much sort of, you know, he, 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 he very, he talks about notions of dreams, but he, he very rarely, if, if ever, really talks about Freud and psychoanalysis, which is quite, quite interesting. But his kind of model is precisely operates on the, in that kind of way about um, surface phenomena, 
leading to an understanding or diagnostics of these deep-seated uh, structures and emotions. Um, even in Caligari, uh, which seems to be the most uh, important in terms of this notion of a, you know, he even calls it a psychology, a psychological history of the German film. Um, he doesn't really refer to Freud, uh, as, as, as I recall, I mean, someone may be able to prove me wrong by, by finding a nice reference to Freud in there right now. But um, this notion then of, of uh, this needing, this, the key notion is that the surfaces are there to be read, uh, not, just, not to be read for their own sake, but to be read precisely for that which, which underpins them and underlies them. And so I think, you know, postmodernists would, 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 would dispute that idea that there is a depth there at all, the depth is actually a myth or a fiction, and there is nothing but the surface. So I think um, I think there would be there would be a, a sort of difference a difference there. But I do think I do think there's some there'd be some really interesting ways of thinking 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 crack out in relation to someone like Poetry, although definitely yeah. Um, I mean, I've got, I've got so many other questions because they're really super interesting uh, talk. Uh, and one of the things, uh, maybe just to kind of like pick up on 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 uh, I, I, the, the one thing that I find a little tricky in um, in 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 Krakow is that you talk about this kind of demythologization, that, but but it somehow invites the mythic in a strange way. So it's kind of a very paradoxical sort of kind of world, and 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 and. and that that goes alongside the kind of the way in which kind of rationality turns into ratio, or the, the term that that uh, that that that, that um, Krakow uses. And I'm just wondering that because because something is happening, I think, in terms of the um, uh, uh, of the way of uh, of the way that, that the 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 religious is itself also mutating in some ways. It's kind of like it, it's just a rationality gives the radio, but myth, but myth mythologization richer becomes something else. And I'm I'm just wondering um, what that might be um, and how we might understand it. It, it. Do you have your own reflections on, on that? It, what, the, what is the what is the what is the notion of you know when 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 this these head, empty hollowed out shells become colonized by the mythic? How is that mythic different to the notion of religion itself, per se? Yeah, I think I think this, uh, this it's a really it's a really good question. I I I think um, okay. So let me let me give you let me let me let me take a uh, let me let me take a, a mythic form which which we could relate to the Tiller girls, for instance. Because I'm 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 going to give a paper fairly soon precisely on this notion of myth actually and i'll refer to this example um let, let's take let's take um let's take Horkheimer Adorno's dialectic of enlightenment for a moment and one of the key central central passages in there is about the figure of odysseus for instance um and odysseus tied to the mast with his uh, so he can hear the, the sound of the sirens uh, singing their song, which is supposed to seduce him and seduce his crew and lead them onto the onto the rocks. Hogan and Adorno focus on uh, the figure of Odysseus as a figure of cunning. He stopped the stopped the ears of his crew with wax so they can row uh, and uh, don't hear the singing. But he then himself this is kind of the tortured bourgeois figure then who ties himself to the mask so he can hear the music but he cannot respond to it in any way uh, I think they're I think they're, they're looking in the uh, I think they're looking in the wrong place all kind of <laughs> right? um, I like the notion of distraction in Krakow and, and, and Benjamin and I think they're distracted by Odysseus I'd like to turn our attention not to Odysseus I'd like to turn our attention to his crew. <laughs> what are his crew doing, right? Um, and what his crew are doing is rhythm, a rhythmic activity of bodily movement, right? They are rowing, which must be one of the most primordial forms of rhythmic work that we that, 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 that exists in actual fact, the, 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 the galley rowers, right? Um, Think of that movement. Think of those oars 
moving in time, usually to a beat, actually. And what you had is a kind of mythic vision of the Tiller girls <laughs> in some way, right? Um, and, and so I think this idea of rhythm itself as has a kind of is deeply imbued with with mythic forms, the rhythm of repetition, uh, the rhythm the rhythm of, of sameness, uh, and I think that the Tiller girls become this model of, of 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 repetition, but also which has a mythic element, but then it's allied to or alloyed with um, the kind of this sort of notion of of the technocratic. And the machinic as well. We can see in that beautiful clip that you showed from Metropolis, for instance, is also about rhythm uh, and a machinic rhythm. And so these kind of notions of rhythm are, on the one hand, seemingly highly technological, and on the other, they are mythological and ancient as well. Um, and so I think for Krakow, this coming together of the technological and high, uh, uh, wholly new and of very kind of uh, archaic forms uh, is produces this kind of new kind of hybrids of mythology within with, within the modern. The, 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 the religious the religious aspect of this, I think, is quite was really interesting. I think you described it really in, in, a, in a really beautiful way when we talked about those, those contrasting images of the Maria and, and the robotic figure. Because for Krakow, there is some, there is definitely something about modernity in which notions of some notions of the spiritual or the transcendent in some way have been lost. And there is an element of that in Krakow that um, in the detective novel, um, he talks about the sort of separation of spheres, the church, as you pointed out, and the hotel lobby are contrasted. And the kind of the disappearance of sort of religiosity is part of this process of disenchantment. And there is something that is lost in that process. There is something to be gained in rationality and something to be lost as well. Um, and I think that this notion of our sensitivity to the world, our openness to the world, our experience of the world is, which we might describe under the term aura, for instance, uh, is something in Krakow that is lost. And I think that's why you're, you were absolutely right to point to the differences between Krakow and Benjamin, because where Benjamin sees the dispense of aura, tends to see the dispense of aura, as a sort of precondition for a politicization of the aesthetic, uh, precondition for exploding the dream world, uh, but very much a sort of, you know, a, 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 a kind of way in which sort of aura is enmeshed in sort of the, the cultic and uh, uh, romanticism, perhaps. Um, Krakauer, I think, his notion of sort of the restoring our senses to the uniqueness of things um, actually is a kind of oraticization potentially of the world. And I think that's a very different way of approaching uh, modernity in actual fact. Modernity then as something in which things have been lost. I think Benjamin is much more in that sense of, you know, sort of revolutionary with the flow, if you like, of, of those, of, of technology. Krakow is much less so in, in that respect. So I think there are some really important differences there. I'm sorry, I'm not sure that really addresses your, 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 your question. No, no, it, and I, I think it's, a, that's it, but it is like an ongoing kind of thing. To, it, it, I think I'd love to see an article by you on that, actually, Graham, I think, because it's something that needs to be teased out a little, little bit further. I mean, I, I just want to comment, I don't want another question, follow-up question, but I, I'm wondering whether the term you use the term religiosity. I'm just wondering in, in Millennium Culture, which is a book that's now out of print and so on, whatever, I, I, I kind of say that actually religion, religion with the capital R has disappeared to be replaced mm. by religiosity, in which you can mm. see it in the kind of the realm of the supermarket, for example, mm. where you kind of, it comes this fan, phantasmagoria where things are conjured up as if from nowhere, which gives it mm. this kind of edge. But then you have these loyalty cards and things that, you know, you, you go there with it, which is precisely part of that similar kind of logic. I just want to show you something just to go to, to, to raise another question also um, 
I, I, maybe I could just share my screen a second just to, to show this one more time. And that is to say, I'm wondering whether um, in the, uh, whether the, uh, the, the, sorry, I'm trying to find what I'm doing here. Um, uh, okay, yeah. Um, can I share that? I, for some reason it's appeared to spin off my screen. Um, um, sorry, excuse me a second. Um, let me just, I can't even do anything right now. Can you see my screen at the moment? No, we don't see your screen. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah. Let me try. Maybe I'm doing that wrong. Okay, let me just try that one. Okay, try that. I mean, okay, good. So I want to just kind of like point to us, because I also wanted to raise that sort of question just as the kind of... Um, uh, well, rationality is turned to the ratio, and and um, and mythic is turned into something else. I also want to sort of question whether we are getting a kind of sort of dialectical kickback in the question of the the notion of what what sexualization might mean, because you you speak about the desexualization of the Tiller girls, and I, thank you for that kind of reference to to uh, John Tiller. That was fascinating, really interesting. I'm just wondering whether you can't see actually another kind of thing creeping in you know, and so it's a sexualization so we shall we say of the machinic and i was going to play you this this one um piece which is um which is from a, a celebration i think of the 100th anniversary of the communist Party. i forget exactly what it was but it was it was a um this is a kind of marching a military marching but there's something curious about this because you get these this troop of, of 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 female soldiers. Apparently, actually, they were recruited. I heard the story from from actresses and things. They're much more sort of you know uh, 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 attractive, should we say, most of the military. I just want to play this uh, a second to see what. You think. <laughs> 参加受业的女民兵中有国家公务员、企业职工。So I think you get the picture there, um, where you know these kind of wearing pink and and you know it, it's it's would that be fair to say that, that that you could also see the kind of other form of sexualization, sexuality per se disappearing, but something else reemerging? Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's that's a, that's a fascinating clip, uh, and I would. I would, I would, I would certainly uh, say. I think what um, I mean, Krakow's line in the Tiller Girls, this notion of deroticization, which you, which was kind of, which is a bit curious because you think actually this is, you know, quite a, supposedly quite an erotic, sexualized spectacle in many ways is this kind of breaking up of the body, this notion of the inorganic and its fragmentation. And as you said, it's precisely, it's turning these bodies into parts of a machine. Um, and that's how, that's how he sees it. I would, I would say that, yes, I would, I, I, I think I would agree, agree, agree with you completely here that what we, we could also see is something, something else as the, as the, as the human body becomes mechanized in this way, then the machine, is itself then turned into a sexually uh, valorized form in some ways. Um, I think uh, we could understand this. Um, you know, we could take we could take a nice little Marxist line on this and talk about the notion of the fetish and fetishization, uh, for instance. Um, we see that I think beautifully illustrated in Metropolis itself um in which is a film Krakow hated by the way <laughs> and, and and he hated uh, um uh the um Berlin Symphony of a Great City uh which was also uh, uh scripted by Karl Meyer and also Karl Meyer wanted had his name taken off it uh, because he betrayed what he wanted, what he wanted. He was the most successful scriptwriter, unfortunately for him. Um, but I think we see um, in, in uh, Metropolis, you know, clearly the figure of Maria, uh, the robot, is a highly sexualized, uh, eroticized female figure, right? Um, and who dances in a wild, kind of crazy, way and 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 uh there's that sort of at a party and there's a famous shot where all these kind of eyes uh 
appear because she becomes the focus of the, the male gaze, essentially. So this kind of eroticization of, of the machine, I think is, is, I think you're absolutely right. I think is, is the kind of counterpoint to this. And we can see this, this idea of, that it becomes actually something of a, of a commonplace when we look at uh, other sort of cinematic representations of, uh, of robots, replicants, AI, etc. cetera, from uh, the, the, the Maria here is a sort of precursor of a whole series of these kinds of figures from um, uh, including uh, in um, uh, Ex Machina, for instance, uh, or uh, Zora, the dancer in Blade Runner, uh, Joy, the disembodied uh, virtual non-machine but uh, holographic figure uh, in uh, in Blade Runner uh, 2049, uh, uh, Chris, of course, in Blade Runner as well, that this idea of the, the, the eroticization of the robotic, the sexualization of the inorganic is the kind of counterpoint, I would say, to that de-eroticization of, of, uh, of, of the organic, of the, of the living body, and this celebration then of this mechan mechanical body in some ways. So yeah, I think there is a, I think there is a com complex, machine aesthetic so i was just looking just as just as just a, the, the first moment when i when i saw that image that you were showing how much those those groups of marching individuals look like microchips uh process <laughs> proceeding down a kind of conveyor belt um and there's again that sort of sense in which the individual disappears this sort of non uh this no sort of standardization or industrialization or industrial production of the individual um so yeah, and no, I think there's, a, I think there's, um, uh, you know, perhaps the sort of uh, the the kind of key text there would be um, uh, sometimes fashion, fascinating fascism, for instance, around that kind of eroticization of um, uh, a sort of fascistic aesthetic, in that sense. Yeah, just I, I think you've raised a very <laughs> this is kind of almost like a PhD topic you just kind of floated out there. This, but I, I'm I'm I mean, I, I'm one of the things that kind of disturbs me, but also kind of fascinates me. I don't know if you've ever seen watching. I mean, I'm on Instagram and I get this kind of like a, a like for example, a Sophia the the robot. The kind of comments that go on in the in the chat from I mean, God knows who these people are, but they absolutely they're kind of falling in love with these robots and complete her in a in a in a disturbing, really disturbing way. But what I would say is that kind of I was at um, Ars Electronica a few years ago, and they had these really primitive um, sex robots there. But you know, really primitive. But frankly, as these are going to get better, you could absolutely sort of see this kind of the potential. For for the, the the sex industry of this these robots in mm. in an obvious and, and a very very disturbing sort of way. Um, I just want to say, and I don't want to distract the conversation because there are a whole series of questions and things. And I want to finish with one question, but I want to say also, I think that the the whole disciplining the body does tend to sort of open up a possible Foucauldian sort of uh, kind of uh, discourse. You know, how would Foucault and Krakauer go together? You know, I don't think there's any reference to the Tiller girls or anything like that in in, in Foucault, but it'd be interesting. There's another PhD topic right there. Um, so anyway, what I did want can I, to- Can I just pick you up on that, Neil? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go. I, mean, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think, I think actually the kind of Foucauldian uh, biopolitics would be a really interesting thing to link with Krakow because you can see, you know, you know Foucault's model of uh, the disciplined body is, you know, comes from sort of the soldier, the Prussian army, uh, doing of drill, for instance, and here we can see a different kind of, uh, you know, presentation of precisely those forms of, of discipline, um, you know, in and the creation of docile bodies, the creation of bodies that are responsive and move in time. As I said, you know, the notion of rhythm as a disciplining mechanism. Um, so it's not only the disappearance of the individual, but it's that notion of synchronization. Uh, which is a, which is a, I would describe it as a, as a martial or military aesthetic. Um, and so I think you're absolutely right to say that Foucault would be a really interesting uh, way of thinking about the mass ornament 
uh, and the significance of the mass movement as a form of biopolitical spectacle. Yeah, just one, one final question for me, because I yes. think this has been so fascinating. We've got a whole string of questions. Also, Yiguo will ask, waiting for you to ask a question. But let me just slip this in quickly. And that is to say, you know, I think that the what was interesting about all of these these individuals is the kind of the, the ones I mentioned early on is also Gropius and Mies and, and, and uh, both Krakow and Benjamin, all potentially shifting across to the states. And of course, Adorno did that too, but came back right very quickly as soon as he could kind of thing. He didn't really like it, the states. And I, you know, I, I often ask this kind of question, what has been lost in translation in, in this kind of process? And especially in the context of Gropius, the, in the sense the um, uh, this was somebody who'd come out of, of, of you know, the melting pot of, of this incredible Germany who'd served in the First World War and received two iron crosses, by the way, you know, in that war. And he goes across to, to um to Harvard, teach at Harvard, and I, you really think that something's been lost there in terms of the whole milieu out of which he comes. And, 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 and I'm just wondering, to some extent, whether Krakow also suffered from that kind of trans, translation in some way. But the figure I wanted to bring up, who is, I think is another uh, figure, and of course, Europeans have been fascinated by the states. I mean, there's a long history of, you know, Baudrillard and uh, um, um, uh, uh, Umberto Eco, and who both you know, better dismissing the states, but Baudrillard, as we were saying last time, probably secretly, secretly admiring the states. And there's, of course, another individual in architectural culture um, who uh, is part of that in some ways, Rem Kohlhaas, who came across to uh, the states, who wrote a book um, uh, about, uh, about the metropolis, about New York, delirious New York. And there is one interesting kind of aspect of that book, which is a really amazing book in, in all sorts of ways. Um, but there's one aspect that he that he draws upon, and he contrasts two particular individuals in the context of New York. One, Le Corbusier, and then Salvador Dali. And and Le Corbusier was somebody, to, according to Rem, who completely misunderstood New York, who's tried to make it you know more rational in a kind of strange way. And and I mean, thank God that that vision was never realized. But then you know, then there's Dali, who sees it as a kind of like a a delirious spectacle of something that is alive, that is animated, you know. And you can see those two worlds of Krakow, the ratio and, and the whatever it is, the spiritual or the played out in that sort of way. And I was wondering whether the, I don't know if you know that book, but but just to kind of throw that at you as a kind of as, as a thought. Thanks, Neil. No, um, I don't. <laughs> um, I think one of the um, just just on that what what is lost if I deal with that first maybe what is lost from Krakow I I think Krakow is really interesting because um, he he starts writing in English almost as soon as he arrives in in, in the United States um, uh, he arrives in 1941 uh, I don't think he spoke any English before he arrived but he arrives in 1941 1947 he's already writing written Caligari which is quite extraordinary really. Um, Adorno berates him for saying that you've lost your, you've lost your style, you've lost your ability to write unless you write in German. German is the only language you should really be writing. Not, that's not, not the most surprising remark from, from Adorno, really. Um, Krakow never writes in German again, though. He, he, he stays within the, the Anglophone Academy, such as such as it is, he works on a whole series of uh, bits and pieces uh, brought up uh, by reports, etc. This bit of money from this foundation, this bit of money from the other. He gets some work through the uh, Bureau of Applied Studies, um, attached to Columbia University. Um, I uh, he never returns. I mean, he does return to Germany, but he never returns for long to Germany. Uh, he becomes a U.S. citizen with his wife. In 1946, um, I I think of all the figures in a way. Um, I mean, the the, the three that are the most obvious: uh, Lerventhal, Marcuse, and Krakow. Um, Lerventhal uh, gets a job in uh, Lerventhal and, and, and Krakow are really good friends. Um, Lerventhal gets a job in, at um, Stanford and then uh, at uh, Berkeley. Um, uh, Marcuse gets a job at Brandeis and then San Diego, I think, I think that's right. Um, they, they're both absorbed into the academy. Krakow doesn't get a job. <laughs> Krakow has no reason to stay in the United States. Krakow has no academic post. He could much more easily go back to Germany. He could find work 
uh, working as a journalist again, which is kind of prohibited to him in, 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 in the US, really. Um, so there is nothing to hold him in the United States. Uh, there is nothing to keep him there, and yet he stays. And I think that says something about his his relationship with Germany. He lost family uh, in in uh, in the Holocaust. Um, it also says something about his willingness to uh, to adapt and adopt U.S. citizenship and become an American. I can't imagine Adorno ever ever <laughs> doing such a thing. Uh, so, and, and you know, Krakow is, is, you know, Adorno is so much younger. You know, Krakow arrives in the United States, you know, he's 50, he's 50, 52, 53, something like that, years old, you know. Um, he learns a new language, he, he becomes an American citizen. So I think there's something incredibly uh, adaptive about, uh, about Krakow that, 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 that is sort of, um, uh, the, I think Benjamin makes a kind of snide remark about him when they're in Marseille that 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 Krakow will always find a way to survive. <laughs> um, he, he he always managed to land on his feet somehow. You know, he's a bit of a bit of a operator in some way. Um, uh, and I think I think so. I think so. I think that I don't, so I'm not sure what what is what whether whether it be true to say that anything's been lost. In Krakow's case, actually, I think there are things to be gained because I think that it is here that he really starts to explore film in really interesting ways. I mean, the Caligari book saves his life. He gets um, that's what gives him a job uh, in New York, uh, the archives there, and that's what gets him his visa to go through Spain to go to Lisbon so he can get the ship uh, to to America. So the Caligari book, the Caligari project, saves his life. Um, and I think he he you know he 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 produces some really interesting and fascinating work. I think Theory of Film is a really undervalued book. I think Caligari is a really undervalued book. Um, how does he respond to the city? I think yes. I think the the kind of the way into the city for him becomes film, um, in the sense that he becomes interested in. He uses his term quite a lot, the flow of life. Um, he's interested in improvisation. He's interested in distraction. He's interested in the serendipitous. He's interested in coincidence. He writes on slapstick comedy, for instance, and what he likes about slapstick comedy is the way in which objects don't do what objects are supposed to do. Um, and the way in which objects can be reused and repurposed. So it's interested in bricolage. So he's interested in all these kinds of aspects of everyday life. Um, and above all, everyday life as it's lived on the street. Um, the flow of life in the street, he says, is what the camera attends to. And so I think he's really fascinated by these forms a sort of filmic flaneur if you like not the sort of uh, bourgeois uh, surveying at ease the the, the 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 poor of the city but but uh, an exploration of the city led by happenstance and chance I think this is this is a kind of a camera following that uh, uh, people moving through the city uh, is very much in kind of crack our sort of spirit. I would position him um, uh, on the scale of being torn between um, uh, the, 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 the sort of Le Corbusier modernism and the surrealists. He's much closer to the surrealists um, for me. Um, again, who he doesn't, I'm just thinking whether he refers to, I don't think he refers to the surrealists. He writes a lovely essay on expressionism. Um, but he doesn't write about the surrealists. But I think that's that's his tendency. That's where he's where he's drawn. So um, just one just comment now. I want to put the, uh, get Igor in a second. But one just comment. I don't know if you know, but um, Herbert Marcuse's son, Peter Marcuse, went to go and teach in uh, Columbia in the planning department at Columbia School of Architecture 
planning and preservation. Um, I don't know if, he, if I've never looked at his work as such, but it'd be interesting to go back and trace it and try and see if anything of his father, well, how much of his father's thought had permeated his own thinking about urban planning. Um, anyway, Yigwo is, I don't want to invite her in to, to kind of ask her question. I should say that she is a PhD student from China, uh, now working in um, uh, in uh, in Italy under Pippo Chiora, who's going to be coming onto our final session on, on Tafori, and she's working on turbocharged capitalism in uh, Hong Kong and Shenzhen. You would like to um, um, uh, ask your question? Yes, thanks for this wonderful lecture because I'm always curious about the Benjamin's work. And recently I also uh, focused on my chapter of the PhD dissertation was focused on what Benjamin, but as I'm a uh, Architect, I focus on first the single part of the Benjamin wrote the phenomenon of the passage by this book as Paris, the capital of the 19th century. As secondly, I focus on the Kuha series as the New York is the capital of the 20th, 20th century and called by his book like a daily race New York. And my work right now is hypothesized as the Shenzhen and Hong Kong is the capital of the 21th century. So my question would be for you, and how do you think about in what way can Benjamin as the phenomenal passage on the topic of the 19th century could be applied to analyze and understanding the special dynamic of the megapolis as the Shenzhen typical, typical metropolis as Shenzhen and Hong Kong in the 21st century? And how might this perspective inform the contemporary debates, serious debates about around the urban development and social inequality and social injustice and the digitalizing world and the buildings, environmental and the extremely capitalist, capitalist way. Like, so how do you think can choose uh, inform and analyzed about the, this kind of questions used the practice the way used Benjamin's passages work to the 21st century. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Thanks for that. Uh, that's, that's that's a really great question. I, you know, there is there is a really lovely book by. Um, oh, um, I'm just trying to think of uh, of, of, of the name. On which imagines Benjamin manages to escape to New York by David Kishik uh, and abandons the, his study of Paris and, and writes a book about uh, new post-war New York instead. Uh, it's a really uh, amazing piece of work. And instead of writing about Baudelaire, he writes about um, you know uh, Andy Warhol or, or, or whatever it might be. So how does Benjamin, let's, 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 let's think for a moment how Benjamin uses architecture. And Benjamin is obviously not an architectural specialist in that sense, but he uses the arcades. First of all, he uses the arcades, um, uh, well, in two different ways. The first is that he's, he's, his, his interest is sparked by the arcades as they are disappearing, as they are being knocked down, as they are being, uh, as they've fallen into disrepair and ruin. So that, I think that's a very interesting idea um, that, and Krakow looks at the Linden Passage in, in Berlin in, in, in a similar way. The idea of that which is disappearing, um, not that which is present, not that which is new, um, but rather the moment in which uh, buildings become ruinous. Um, looking back then, then the Arcades Project itself then kind of reconstructs the sort of archeology span of the arcades um, as um, he says architecture as the, the the kind of key example of the latent mythology of the, of the present so the way in which the arcades railway stations um, exhibitions uh, and other structures department stores for instance become this sort of phantasmagoria phantasmagoria of space phantasmagoria of modernity um, so how might we how might we take those ideas and think about uh, architecture today. If we look at arcades today, let's say, because there's arcades still exist, um, actually what's really interesting about the arcades is the way they have been 
um, they've been they've been kind of become newly fashionable again in the 21st century. So many of them have been restored. They now have exactly the kind of high end, expensive shops lining them that maybe was was a sort of an echo of how they were when they were first constructed. So what's interesting here is is the way in which the life and the afterlife of architecture and buildings goes through different phases uh, uh, and moments. We could look at this in terms of sort of the sort of the the, the follower of the 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 the, the arcades and something like the shopping mall, which had its own uh, phase of huge expansion and popularity um, in across Europe, obviously North America, but also more recently in in China, building of huge um, shopping complexes, etc. Also in Malaysia. Interestingly, now the period of the shopping mall is perhaps also over um, with online shopping and virtual spaces, etc. But those shopping malls themselves are now just about arriving at a point of their ruination, of their disuse, of their reconfiguration, that they're going to turn into the, the ruins of the future. In fact, they're just kind of turning into ruins now. So I think one way would be one way of thinking about architecture and its significance today would be to look at look at what are the contemporary ruins, what are the spaces that are disappearing, what are the spaces that are being boarded up. I mean, in many ways, so much of our city centres, certainly in, in the UK, are now sites of ruination, um, and even the kind of newest, shiniest buildings are being emptied out as. Um, crowds start to disappear and, and start to shop online uh, in their droves instead. Perhaps we need to look at um, not so much city spaces anymore uh, or city spaces as abandoned spaces. Maybe that would be kind of uh, interesting, but also then perhaps we, we need to start thinking about digital spaces as well and how these are occupied or not, how we browse them, how we move through those kinds of spaces as well. VR, and getting onto the subject that I know is so close to Neil's, uh, Neil's heart, the, the whole sort of AI uh, and these kinds of you know, virtual spaces, virtual configurations, how these spaces might be spaces also of a new kind of ruination, potentially abandoned websites, abandoned structures, old fashioned, outdated uh, ways of moving or scrolling uh browsing through websites so i think i think that there is a hugely interesting things that you can do uh in terms of this notion of a kind of the the uh the kind of architecture of bygone days which is the starting point for benny means arcades and i think that's where i would think uh start to think about that and sort of looking at perhaps some of those sort of grand designs of uh the 20 21st century you know the sort of uh the guggenheim and uh other, these other kinds of uh, as Baudrillard describes of spaceships that seem to have landed in the middle of our city centers um and uh what these these kinds of spaces might be uh, as they become, uh, as they probably will uh, at some point, uh, forms of dereliction and ruination. So I think it's the notion of ruination that I would think I would I think is the thing to take to take forward. I hope that helps. Yes, very helpful. Thank you. I will use your suggestion to add the quote for my dissertations later. Thank you so yeah. much. I mean, China. China is a really interesting example because, I mean, clearly, on on the one hand, there are huge, huge movements in terms of urbanization and construction of, of cities, huge cities from from scratch. Um, you know, cities that are bigger than London from scratch. The cities I, I will never, I, I, have, I can't give you the names. I've never never heard of them, and I wouldn't know the names. You know, but they are vast um, uh, metropolises, and yet there's also a sort of a, a sense in which um, perhaps that some of these are not going to be filled to capacity. Some of them may, may remain half built, half, half, you know, in, in the process of construction. 
without ever actually being finished because the populations are maybe not going to be moved to, moved to them because of being pulled elsewhere or whatever. So I think there's I think there's really interesting sort of tensions in that, not just the derelict and the abandoned, but the kind of half finished and half built as well. I mean, maybe just to say, to put names to these things. I mean, I think that uh, Ordos is a classic example of an unpopulated city. Uh, Shenzhen, where actually Yi comes from, is, uh, is, is an example of a city that appeared from nowhere. I mean, 30, 40 years ago, <laughs> it was just sort of villages, you know, in the countryside. Um, yeah. I just want, what final to just comment on this thing, we will move on. I want to ask Fasco if he wants to ask his, uh, oh, his, his mic's not working, so I'll read it out for you, his question. Um, but just one thing, I, you know, I wonder whether, whether you know, this kind of mal culture, I mean, to my mind, what really stands out in Hong Kong is, is, the, is the airport, which is this incredible shopping mall. And, I, you know, there's a debate going on between Mark Auger, who said, thinks it's a kind of like it's a, it's a, um, it's a kind of a, a, a non-place, and Ren mm-hmm. Corlas, who sees it as absolutely central to the way we operate today. There's they, these kind of, these cities in themselves somehow that uh, mm. become so so kind of- I think, I, th- I think, I mean, non places is one of my favorite terms. Um, and I love what Auger does because there's a kind of, there's a beautiful irony in his, his notion of non-place because he says, these are places of no significance. And yet by drawing our attention to them, of course he makes them of, of the places of most significance for us in our understanding of contemporary urban space. So I think the sort of, uh, there's, uh, you know, I'm sure that, 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 that Marc Auger is fully aware of this, this, this irony. Uh, and, um, but I do, yeah, I agree with you completely. I think, I think kind of, you know, the, 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 the airport becomes this um, site of implosion of shopping mall theme park as well, of, of course, is the other kind of classic sort of postmodern space uh, that we might want to talk about. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 in fact, you know, one goes to, one could happily go to the airport shop and then just go home again, um, <laughs> rather than actually go anywhere uh, these days. Um, but I, I saw someone else was, uh, was 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 coming in for a question. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's so uh, we have um, Vasco who is in uh, Bangladesh and his mic is not working well. So let me simply ask the question. It's in the chat. Um, uh, how does Krakow's interest in memory and its relationship to human experience help us to better understand the ways in which architecture and urban spaces can be served as sites of memory and historical? significance how does krakow's interest in memory and well, its that's a that's a that, that, that's a fantastic question um so let me pick on one example which i think is really beautifully illustrated illustrative of the kinds of work that he does in those little feuilleton in um Strassen in berlin und anders wo um, oh, and I forgot to mention that unders vote elsewhere. Now that's, a, now that's a key term. <laughs> um, the street without memory. Um, Krakow talks about the experience of uh, going into a cafe before he was going get, getting on a train or something somewhere. And he goes in and goes to a cafe, has a cup of coffee or whatever. Decides another, a few, uh, sometime later to revisit it. Um, he goes back there and discovers it's gone. Um, and it's been replaced by something else. And he says, this is the way of capitalism is this process of erasure, uh, is this process by which um, the, that which has failed, perhaps, that which has been ruinous, is not allowed to survive as ruins, is not allowed to remind us of failure, but is eradicated straight away, replaced by something else. And we, we, we you know, when you see a shop, uh, particularly in shopping malls, are a really good example of this. Um, uh, something, something goes out of business. It's never gone out of business. It's all new and forthcoming. You know, just about to arrive is something blah 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 to replace it. Yeah, and he describes this as 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 um, uh, a street without memory um, because it is it bears it refuses to bear any traces of its past. And I think that is um, something that is uh, this eradication of the past, this amnesia about the past is uh, 
a kind of key idea in Krakow. It's another form of the impoverishment of everyday life. It's also a response to the overstimulation of everyday life that we see in Zimmel. Um, the interesting thing is that the street has no memory, but Krakow does. <laughs> the Krakow remembers this spot. So it exists, but it exists only in memory. Um, and I think that this idea of amnesia and the eradication of memory, which is a kind of common theme in the work of the Frankfurt School, uh, all, um, all reification is a forgetting, Adorno says. It's a key thing clearly in the work of Benjamin, the work of uh, memory and, and forgetting in, in Proust, uh, in Baudelaire as well, in the figure of the storyteller. This notion of the erasure of memory uh, is bound up with a diminution of experience, the, the shift from ephoral to elevedness, particles of experience from coherent experience. I would also like to connect it with uh, another, a more contemporary writer um, who I often think of in terms of, uh, in relation to, to Marc Auger, the, the historian uh, Pierre Nora and the idea of lieu de mémoire, which, which sort of seems to, uh, spaces of memory, which, or sites of memory, which seems to be um, very much a sort of counterpoint in a way to um, the idea of non-place. Um, but interestingly, Nora, by sites of memory, doesn't necessarily mean spaces, but he means places of, of, of communal or collective commemoration, um, war memorials for instance, or museums or specific buildings. He's talking in French context and he's talking about um, other forms of mythologies as Roland Barthes would describe them, the Tour de France. Um, these kinds of things are also lieu de memoir, sites of nation building, he says. He talks about um, dictionaries and children's books and Asterix of Gaul and, and figures like this. These are also sites of memory for um, uh, Nora. Um, why is this relevant? Because I think the interesting thing is that for Nora, he says that these sites of memory are evidence not of a culture of memory, but rather they're evidence of a culture of amnesia. They're about forgetting. They're about forgetting other places. Um, and so here we see these kind of rituals of commemoration, uh, this directed media-focused attention upon particular moments, uh, particular sites, particular features, is all part of a, of a, of a culture amnesia, he says, um, uh, and uh, the attempt to construct history, attempt to construct history, which is a forgetting. Why is all this important? Why is all this interesting? Because I think you can see here very clear connections to um, the ways in which the pasts of other people and other pasts are forgotten. That in the, just a street without memory, a society without memory, or a society with only a very particular memory constructed by Lieu de Memoir is one in which many peoples are marginalized. Not only the people who are discriminated, discriminated against in the present, who suffer in the present, but who then suffer oblivion in the present as well. Um, so we hear, you know, calls for different voices to be heard, marginalized voices from the past, under the rubric of sometimes of decolonizing um, those who have been ignored, those who've been downtrodden, the tradition of the oppressed, as Benjamin terms it, and their voices have been lost. They are the figures who have been forgotten. And I think. The whole uh, tenor of the writings of someone like Prakauer, Benjamin, uh, is about saving these voices from oblivion, uh, arguing against dominant forms of history, arguing against the construction and constructedness of our memories and the privileging instead of those who our society, and the powerful in our society would condemn to being forgotten. So I think memory is actually really much, very much at the, memory, 
who is remembered and the processes of memory, how memories can uh, engage with or motivate the present, I think is, 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 is really at the center of a lot of work in, in, the, in, in the Frankfurt School. I think it's key to Benjamin. I think it's key to Krakauer as well. I mean, just a kind of reference there for, for Vasco, there, there's a book by Andreas Huysen, H-U-Y-S-S-E-N, -S -S called Twilight Memories, where he addresses uh, our culture of amnesia. It's kind of like a builder yard, but looking at kind of uh, the question of memory. And I think that's an underrated book. I wish it had memory more centrally in the, the title, but it's all about this amnesia. Um, mm. So I'd like to just... Uh, because, can, I just say, can I just just add on to that? Because, because, because this is polit political, you know, um, who gets remembered is a fundamentally political issue. Um, and any radical politics is going to be about a different kind of memory, a, a different kind of history, and, a, and, a different, and writing a different kind of history as well. And I think that's, you know, that's what that's what Krakauer is trying to do when he looks at Offenbach. This is what Benjamin is trying to do when he looks at the arcades. This is what Benjamin is trying to do when he's talking about uh, Baudelaire. This, this, a different history um, uh, from, from the histories of progress, the history of, um, you know, the kind of history that we are, you know, of, of um, improvement, of betterment, of the glories of capitalism, da, 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 whatever, whatever it may be. It is these histories, these alternative histories that are buried, submerged, uh, marginalized, liminalized, these, these, these are the histories that we need to be recovered. Greg, we've got a bunch of questions that you are a victim of your own success. I always <laughs> judge a good lecture in person if the auditorium contravenes all the fire regulations. And I've seen that very recently <laughs> lecture by Bernard Shumi FIU. But also in terms of the questions that are lined up. So I, I hope you can bear with us because there, there are some, some interesting right. questions here. Let me start by asking um, uh, Gustavo to uh, unmute himself and to ask his question. I would say that Gustavo is in the chat, so is Yi and so is Vasco. If anybody wants to get into the, to, to the Zoom chat for the future, please uh, email us at info at digitalfutures.world and we can, um, we can send you the link to the to the to the Zoom space itself. Um, Gustavo looks really cold where you are. <laughs> <laughs> He's in California. Would you believe that's a testament to our winter <laughs> in is, California? Is, you're not working for the Californian Tourist Board here, are you? You're really, you're really not. <laughs> uh, no, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for um, for all of your um, enlightening discussion. I I wanted to go back to the idea of the new Rosetta Stone. I guess as a Kind of a kind of a metaphor of where we are. Um, uh, I wrote a question in the chat: um, computational algorithms and the tools behind AI creating, moving, and terra and terraforming our world. Is this new type of lens? And it seems as though that we've moved from the from traditional media painting. Um, technology has evolved from live performance to sound to recordings, photography, movies. Now it's the computational generative in the AI. How do you, how do we keep track of the idea of authorship or responsibility if the hands of these algorithms or technologies have been made or embedded in corporations or tens of thousands of people have made them like how do you see that view it seems as though we don't have one view uh it would be like um like a metaversal view like the god view every person would be an eye in this world how do you see our rosetta stone or can you hypothesize what that could be ah uh, that's a that's a that's a great question um i I think, I mean, I, I would, um, I think we are right to be extremely concerned about uh, the developments that are taking place in terms of uh, AI and the use of algorithms. The kind of computational world, um, the, the, the kind of, way in which numbers work, uh, the way in which algorithms work. Um, 
is part of that kind of world that Krakow, I think, sees coming into being. Obviously, he's writing in, in, in you know, 100 years ago, um, but this sort of industrial techno complex as it comes into being, that the human is lost. Krakow is very much, uh, I think, um, uh, one book two times he was a reluctant humanist. Um, I'm not quite sure how reluctant he is about it, actually. Um, but I certainly certainly see uh, that he would see that this idea of uh, being lost within these machineries, if I can call them that, these these systems, um, is terrifying, um, and that it is precisely. I think the whole tenor of the sort of Frankfurt School is that these systems themselves become irrational dominating, controlling, um, that the human is lost um, and that decisions are taken away from humans and put into uh, these cybernetic systems or whatever. Um, you know, cybernetics is, what, you know, what is it? Actually, you know, interestingly, you know, going back to my, going back to my um, uh, Odysseus's ship, Metaphor: Cybernetics comes originally from the, from the, as we know, from the notion of the the uh, the steerer of the ship, right? So here we see we see we see you know we could we could we could take that Odysseus and say okay, forget about Odysseus, forget about the rowers, who's steering the damn thing? <laughs> right? And that takes us to cybernetics, and that takes us to these feedback loops, and that takes us to these these algorithms, that takes us to these programs, that takes us to those things. Uh, that takes us to those things of where, where, where if you like this, you'll like this, uh, et cetera. If you've read this, this should be next your next reading. This is this is the world in which we are. Our lives are being uh, orchestrated and organized and choreographed for us by these forms, uh, by these systems. So I think that's a quite terrifying prospect. Um, and... I think Krakow's writings, I'm not sure how, how far Krakow gives us tools to deal with these things. Um, uh, in a way, it, it would be, I think he gives us sort of, you know, certain tools, but, but you know, clearly they're, 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 these systems are uh, in way, developing in ways that no, no one writing the, in, in, in before the 1960s could, could imagine, unless you're some science fiction uh, writer. Um, but I do think that they that they they restate some fundamental principles and fundamental notions of critique, which are vital for us, and skepticism towards this techno techno world. Um, I th think um, what was I going to say? Um, Yeah, that that this notion of um, now I just completely forgot what I was going to say. It's really annoying. Um, it'll come back to me, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, no. I, what I was going to say was I, I I was I was was having a cup of coffee with 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 some colleagues the other day, and we often we what we see in the newspaper again is uh, newspapers and articles and things is is how clever uh ai technology is and every advance in ai ai technology can do this and i know neil you write about this um uh in talking about being uh, deep is it deep blue and uh, winning at chess and now winning at go and these kinds of things um and i i was i was looking at this figure ada ai colon da who is being presented to us as as a sort of first robot painter um, and which is and there was a sort of i've seen sort of debate about what what kind of art is this right is it uh, i saw i was read a review in the in the guardian sort of liberal uh, british newspaper castigating these paintings saying in in very kind of curious terms of sort of romantic terms of they have no human soul right <laughs> which I thought was 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 kind of kind of kind of kind of curious kind of way of uh, line of critique, but uh, my colleague came up with a much better line of critique, which was um, 
we don't need robots to paint. Uh, you know, we can do that for ourselves, right? Uh, you know, if, if robots are going to do anything, let them do let them do the things that we don't want to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> let them do the things that we don't want to do, so they can free up our time, so we can paint, right? Um, so, I, and I thought, well, yeah, that's the, that's really that's, that's a really smart thing to say. I thought it was a really smart thing to say. Anyway, um, you know. Uh, Technology has its place. Technology has its role. Someone like Andre Gores would, would, would celebrate new forms of automation and technological development in the sense that they free up the human to do other things for the autonomous sphere so that they can lead human lives and explore our interests so that we can paint, right? We don't, want, we don't need Ada to paint for us, you know? If Ada's doing the painting, who's doing the work? <laughs> um... So, you know, I, Ada can paint, but, but we don't fund our artists to paint. Um, we fund our technologies to paint. You know? um, so I think, uh, I think Krakow, Benjamin, the Frankfurt School, they give us some, some interesting tools, but we need to, you know, obviously, like any kind of Marxist driven form of critique, their ideas are of their time. Uh, we need to adapt, we need to rethink them, we need to apply them, we need to rework them in the conditions of the present. Um, and that's, I guess that's our job. Um, and uh, I think that is our challenge, essentially. Um, maybe that's your challenge, maybe that's your, your, <laughs> the challenge of your generation, uh, yeah. rather than than, 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 than mine. But I think these ideas, I think these ideas, I think in the Frankfurt School, for me, what 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 always, you know, why I've been so fascinated with the work of Benny Mean and Krakauer is that those ideas speak to us. Yeah? yeah. They do speak to us, they do resonate with us, they do have things to say about yeah. our present, right? But we but we but we but of course they are rooted in their own time and we know, must think about them in our time and how they help us in our time uh, and how they're limited also in that in in, in that application as I well. just wanted to thank you very much professor it was an extremely great way to wake up in a cold California morning so thank you great uh, thank you Gustav and I hope it warms up for you <laughs> Yeah, just Thank to kind you. of could pick up on Graham, I, I just Ida. I was <clears throat> I've written something that hasn't been published yet on Ida, but it's got what I mean. And of course, you could use the kind of question: who who needs Dali, D A L L E, when you've got Dali, D A L I? Um, but actually, the real problem about about, about um, uh, uh, the two problems actually about 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 uh, Ida. Do you need a humanoid robot? Absolutely not. No. First of all, secondly, she. It sorry, she it doesn't actually do all the paint. There are a few scratches, and then there's a a human painter who comes in and does those beautiful kind of blues and reds, and the background tones. So actually, it's a complete con. App the whole thing is a con, just as Sophia is a con. And the 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 world of computer science is apoplectic, apoplectic about Sophia, and also should be apoplectic about uh, about Ada. It's a it, I mean, there was a point when I don't know there's a story that uh, Ada was detained by uh, the authorities in Egypt when it was brought to Egypt on suspicion of being a spy because there's a modem and the kind of these cameras in her eyes and things. I think that uh, Ada should have been detained on suspicion of not being an artist at all and actually convicted <laughs> in some way. But, um, okay, so... Greta, be no, careful, be careful, Neil, though, though, though you know, kind of, if, you, if, you, if you decry Ada as an artist for not being an artist at all, you know that's that's what they said about that's what they said about the modernists. You know that's what they, that's what that's what that's what they said about um, the urinal hanging in the, in the gallery. You know, kind of, this is a, this is not an artist. You know, kind of you, you validate them by rejecting by rejecting them in in in, in, a, in, in a way. I, I, so. I love the stories of that urinal when certain artists came into the gallery and used it as a urinal, which I thought was an incredibly <laughs> interesting kind of gesture. So, uh, Graham, we, we, let's try and work much with. We've already have three hours. It's been an incredible session but there are a couple of questions here I want to kind of get from the, the chat. One is uh, the first one, has been, this has been person waiting uh, patiently. Uh, can we say that Siegfried Krakow believed in hermeneutics and endless interpretations with the death of the author in all works of art? Uh, 
Uh, ooh, great question. Yeah, I did see this one. I think this one was the, the, the person has probably um, had about three birthdays since, 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 since they asked that question because it was right at the start of the chat. So apologies for, for making you wait for that. Krakow is certainly into, into, in, interested in hermeneutics, yes. Um, and uh, he is interested in hermeneutics in multiple ways, as we've seen this notion of uh, surface level expressions. Um, we could understand uh, the kind of societal biography as a kind of hermeneutics as well. We could certainly understand his kind of um, his way of looking at film as an interpretive hermeneutic practice as well. So yes, he's he's very much uh, an interpreter. Um, he's also a critic as well, and I am not sure the extent to which um, he is interested in um, the kind of multiplicity of interpretation in the same way that, that you know, the idea, the sort of death of the author, and we can open up um, these uh, films or whatever to endless, endless interpretations. Um, that, Benjamin is more there in a way. I would, I, I would say, the idea of endless interpolations into into the same or investigations of the same thing in the in the uh, Berlin Chronicle part, the, the past as an endless resource. Um, I I think there's also that Krakow would, you know. He talks about the sort of, you know, the grunt, the grunt, the foundation of society here. You know, this is, is he's also interested in, he is interested in forms of determination. He is also interested in uh, revealing, I'm going to use a kind of very old fashioned word here, truths, I think, about the world uh, and the, the fundaments of society. So that's, so that's, so it's not, He's not the, the kind of the endless play of signifiers and significations that sort of postmodernism plays with is, as I sort of said earlier, something that I think he would be uneasy with or unhappy with, I think. Uh, maybe I, I, I don't know. But I think he is there because interested in hermeneutics because he wants to reveal um, social reality. Um, and social reality then has a form, a structure, uh, forms of exploitation, forms of domination, forms of control, uh, etc., which which do not disappear into plays of science, or are not just simply something that we could interpret differently or other. So I think there are limits to to to, to the hermeneutics that he's engaged in. Yeah, maybe a, a kind of a, a, a quick comment. Um, uh, well, a couple of comments. One was um, Mark Age. I once met him at a conference and asked him whether he whether his book Non Leo was a little bit conservative, and he conceded uh, that it was. Um, also, I think in terms of uh, discussions um, with, and this goes back to David Frisbee. Um, and I think a question came up in his because he he wrote a master's on, on architecture, and uh, I was one of the examiners, which is an incredible honor for such a scholar. But I, you know, I think the kind of question about Benjamin and and and, and Krakow in particular is a kind of proto-structuralist. You know, in the sense there was not before even post-structure, before the the play of meaning, there was the kind of, and I think you know they 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 they, they supposed that they, one could interpret the the city and the fabric of the city and so on, but they never really developed into a kind of systematic theory along the lines of de Saussure and, and the whole structuralist project. Um, yeah. Um, so we've got just I don't know there's some because I want to just we ought to wrap up now but just briefly mention um, the some of the the comments in the chat which unfortunately we haven't got a chance to sort of uh, comment on um, uh, and uh, Gustavo has listed them. Let me just simply say the computational algorithms and tools behind AI creating moving and te terraforming our world human existence evolutionary development can that be seen as a new reset of stone I think that's what his question he asked I think. Um, uh, what does that say in our modern world's reliant on, on data and abstraction of information and bodies in space? And then are the new architects, planners and the and invisible hand technology companies? Okay, I'll say, are the new architects, planners and invisible hand technology companies? 
I'm not quite sure of that question. Uh, where does the abstraction mathematics that removes the human directly from the from decision making? Where is the abstraction mathematics that removes humans directly from decision making? And what does that say? Life or death decision, autonomous, driverless cars. Um, I think with given the time constraints, we need to simply kind of float those out there as speculations in sense for the future. Um, uh, but I, we need to we need to wrap this up. I mean, partly the fact it would be daunting for everyone to see the video, um, which it will be watched by many people, I'm sure, but for throw a three three hours plus, which is kind of daunting for anyone. But this is, I you know, I want to say, to Graham, this is an incredible repository of knowledge. You know, not only I think have you really brought Krakow to life and drawn him to our attention, and he really needs to be, I think, you know, uh, seen and understood more uh, by architects throughout the world. It's an astonishing session. I think you, you might have done for Krakow what Hannah Arendt did for Benjamin, at least in the architectural community. And I, I definitely think that he deserves further attention. And I hope that uh, people will pay attention to your books. They have been extraordinary, extraordinary. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Today's session has been really extraordinary in opening up all these kind of questions. And I hope it sets the scene for other things. But I think, you know, one of the things that we asked in, in you know, in, in the title of this uh, series is, you know, what can philosophers, uh, what can architects learn from philosophy? Well, you know, I don't know whether we can call Krakow a philosopher, philosopher as such. He was a, definitely a cultural theorist and a cultural thinker and so on. But even if we, we just open up that term in a broad way, you know, I think the point is a lot. You know, the question, the answer to the question is a lot. We can learn a lot from it. And I also think that, you know, in some senses, I mean, I don't know, we didn't really trust the, the Trump issue, uh, although it's one I raised with Slavoj Žižek at the very beginning of this series. You know, I think not only that, but there are messages that really need to be listened to, you know, messages that were done in the 30s. And there was also a recent article, I think it was Adorno, uh, commenting on the kind of cultural industry. The comments that he said then, back when he was in, in LA over the war, are so relevant to society today. In other words, all these thinkers are, have, a, have a real relevance and they are astonishing. Um, uh, so um, it's been an incredible session. Graham, thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I, thank you. I always so, enjoy listening to you. And you know, you, you, this is, you're, you're a, a master of, 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 of lectures and, 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 and words and, 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 but above all, you what your lectures do your presentation do is they they infect us with the enthusiasm that you have for the subject and you know absolutely wonderful session an incredible way to warm us up in california on a on a chilly sunday morning um but fantastic thank you thank you so much and uh I, I get the feeling this is not, not the end, but the beginning of something else. Um, and I get the feeling that people will be paying much more attention to Krakauer in the future. So all I can say is please take a look at his essays in, in, in uh, the two essays, particularly the hotel lobby in Rethinking Architecture and take a look at uh, Graham's two books, because this is something that I think that is that is just shows us the kind of richness of thinking that came out of uh, the first uh, the, the first half of the 20th century in Germany and and, and really, is not only relevant to architects, but in, 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 of an enduring uh, relevance to society as a whole. And, and I think some of these ideas need to be revitalized and taken further and applied to K-pop and God knows what else. Trump. I know. I think this is this is you've answered the question very very well, Graham. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Neil. Thank you, everybody. And flash mobs. What a great suggestion. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I think I look forward to to a paper on flash mobs and Krakow. I think it was a brilliant, brilliant idea. The, the dissolving into the everyday of dance, not choreography, non choreography. Brilliant idea. That I'm 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 all for flash mobs. I think. <laughs> so one final comment Thank before we leave, before we leave, and that is to say, next week we have um, a session on Homi Baba, who I think also is someone that architects really need to pay attention to for all sorts of reasons. Um, and th that will be with Felipe Hernandez. But please note that next week, the clocks go forward in the States. Um, so if we got up early this morning, we're gonna get even earlier next next week, it's gonna be quite a trial. Um, but we're gonna keep to the 10 o'clock slot, 10, 10 a.m. EST, that's Eastern Coast time, uh, throughout this series, apart from the one session on Kristeva, which uh, will be with a, with a colleague in Australia. So we have to do it in the evening, which is her morning and so on and so on. But otherwise, it's going to be 10 o'clock. But 10 o'clock next week is going to be different to the to people in, in, uh, in, in, in Europe. It's going to be 
uh, it's going to be th uh, for, for Central European time, it's going to be uh, three o'clock rather than four. And it's going to be different also for users in China. It's going to be um, because the clocks don't change in China. It's going to be uh, 10 o'clock in China, which is great because it moves it forward for one hour. So, Graham, fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. I, you know, um, all I can say is I want to just fire, uh, finish off with a, with a, with a, with a comment about uh, uh, the late great. David Frisbee, um, someone who really opened up all this world to all of us. And he was the one who tipped me off about, about you, Graham. He said, I've just read this incredible manuscript for this book. This guy's incredible. And he was absolutely right. And what I read in Mythem of Metropolis is it, you, you were still approaching the subject with incredible imagination and energy and enthusiasm. And thank you for sharing your sharing your 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 insights and your enthusiasm with us today it's been a terrific session one of the best i think we've ever had in this series so thank you this will be uploaded to the digital futures youtube site where everyone can access it for free um wonderful wonderful thank you so much um thank you thank neil you. thank you everybody enjoy thank your you day also, thank also you. just Bye. briefly to the, the team behind this especially to bavlin and all of the, the, the images and so on there is a kind of a machinery beneath all this, which is which is keeping this going, and and a lot of selfless people, uh, selflessly dedicating their time. And thank you, uh, Graham, for selflessly devoting your time um, on this on this Sunday. I'm sure there are better things you can do on a Sunday afternoon, but thank you. This has been fabulous for us, and we all appreciate it. Thank you, Graham. Graham, thank you. You have many fans here. Please come thank to the you. states. Thank soon. you, Gustavo. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for for, for joining. For joining us and, and taking part and listening to me uh it's been a real privilege and pleasure bye now everyone thank you thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.